Okay, the uh, time is 2 p.m., so I will call the Tuesday, February 14th, 2023, regular council meeting to order. Wish everybody a happy Valentine's since we're all sitting around with the people we just adore, right? Yes. <laughs> So welcome to the February 14th council meeting. So I will begin with a land acknowledgement that the city of Fort Saskatchewan is located within Treaty 6 territory and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Nihawak, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto, Nakota Sioux, and Métis. And we acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. It is because of our treaty relationship that we can live, work, and play on Treaty 6 territory. Thank you. All right, so um, we have nothing on the consent agenda. So I will begin with approval of the January 24th regular council meeting minutes. Councillor Abitoye. I'll make a motion that we approve the January 24th council, regular council minutes as presented and circulated. All right, are there any errors or omissions? Not seeing anything, I will close the motion and please cast your vote. And that is carried unanimously, thank you. We have no delegations who have registered this evening. Um, we do have uh, two uh, public hearings and, and we do have uh, at least one person who has registered for that. So we will begin with a non-statutory public hearing for South Ridge Meadows Outline Plan Amendment. So I would invite Lindsay Francis and Cherie Shindy to uh, come forward. So with the public hearing, process administration okay it's a different person but that's okay welcome you Craig um, so uh, with a public hearing um, administration will make their presentation uh, Council will have an opportunity to ask questions. Following that, it will be open for any members of the public to speak in favor or opposed to the uh, to the hearing. And uh, following that, and each one is allowed to ask, ask, be asked questions. Following that, administration would come forward, and if there's any final questions of administration, they would uh, have an opportunity to answer those. Then, once the public hearing is closed, then and we would go on to business arising out of the meeting. And so our first one is a non-statutory public hearing. We are doing it to ensure that we are transparent with the public. So with that, I will open the uh, non-statutory public hearing at 2.03, and I would invite uh, Lindsay to do the presentation. Thank you, Mayor Catcher. And I'd just like to acknowledge, I believe Shree's with us virtually today as well. Yes, she is. <laughs> All right. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay Francis, and I'm the senior planner here at the city. And I'm going to present on the South Fort Ridge Meadows Outline Plan Amendment. So starting off, I'll go over a bit of background, talk about the proposed amendment, our recommendation and rationale, the communications, and then we'll go into questions. So back in July, the terms of reference for outline plans was amended, and through this amendment, Council became the approving authority for outline plans. Later this afternoon, I will be presenting an amendment to the land use bylaw as bylaw C1-23, and to facilitate this land use bylaw amendment, the outline plan must first be amended. So today we're having the non-statutory public hearing as an opportunity for members of the public to provide their input. So to start off with some context, I'll discuss where the outline plan fits in with our planning framework. So at the top, we've got our municipal development plan as our highest level statutory plan. And this sets our long-term vision for the city. And it also gives direction to lower level statutory plans, such as area structure plans. The area structure plans provide details on how neighborhoods are planned. And then they give direction to the outline plans. So outline plans go into further detail and look at areas of a neighborhood and their local road alignment and block configuration. 
So as we go through each of these steps, it gets further and further refined, and then the outline plan then informs our land use bylaw amendments and redistrictings. And I'd also like to go over the amendment process since this is the first outline plan amendment that council will be approved, the approving authority for. So we've got the application in October 2022. And then on January 10th at that council meeting, council scheduled the non-statutory public hearing and gave first reading to the accompanying land use bylaw amendment. So today we're holding the non-statutory public hearing. After the non-statutory public hearing, the outline plan amendment could be made by resolution. And then later today, we have the public hearing for the land use bylaw amendment. And following that public hearing, the land use bylaw amendment could proceed with second and third reading. So now we'll talk a little bit about the proposed amendment. So the reason that the land use bylaw amendment also requires an outline plan amendment is the policy direction within the South Fort ASP. It requires outline plans to identify the proposed location and extent of non-conventional development types, such as reduced or zero setback development. So an overview of the amendment to the outline plan. There are two types of changes in this amendment. The first is to facilitate the creation of the reduced setback lots that would accommodate semi-detached housing with secondary suites shown in the red box on the map. The second type of change is a housekeeping amendment that will show the existing reduced setback housing in the outline plan, which was in the process of approval prior to the South Fort ASP requirement to include the location of reduced or zero setback housing in the outline plans. So please note that there's no additional zero lot line development being authorized with this amendment. And lastly, the amendment would also update the land use statistics and population calculations based on actuals. So this slide shows the proposed reduced setback development and it's located west of Greenfield Link on the plan. The amendment would redesignate the subject site from street-oriented townhouses to street-oriented design medium setback housing. So it would remain medium density residential and it would result in a minor increase in density from 28.2 to 28.3 dwelling units per net residential hectare. And this slide shows the areas of the housekeeping amendment regarding the areas that have already been redistricted to allow for reduced or zero setback development. So administration is in support of this application for the following reasons. It follows the South Fort Area Structure Plan, which requires the outline plan to identify the proposed location and extent of non-conventional development types. The proposal aims to seamlessly integrate with the surrounding development by providing a smooth transition between the low density residential to the west and the higher density forms that are planned to the south. It also allows uh, comparable housing forms to the DC, the RC district that's in the west. So that uh, could have single detached, semi-detached and townhouses. And it's locating higher density in proximity to neighborhood amenities such as the stormwater pond, asphalt trails and a public park. And lastly, it considers housing diversity by allowing suites which have the potential to increase our rental supply and uh, creating additional housing options to occupants who are unable to or who prefer not to undertake routine yard maintenance. So today's non-statutory public hearing was advertised in the Fort Saskatchewan record for two consecutive weeks and landowners within 100 meters of the proposed amendment area were mailed a notice. A copy of the proposed amendment was available on the city's website and two written submissions were received in response to the outline plan and redistricting applications which were submitted to council. So now we will take questions. Great, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, just before I go on to uh, council, so you said there was two written submissions. I looked at them. They were from the same individual, were they not? Uh, no, there was there was two emails from one person, and then there was one other email. Okay, as I well. missed one of them. So, 
Okay. No, I just wanted to double check on that. Okay. So, uh, as we're in a public hearing, this would be clarifying questions only. Councillor Blizzard. I'm kind of confused with the two things because they're back to back and maybe I'm the only one that's not clear on. But first of all, so if we don't pass this, does the next public hearing then not happen because we're, we've turned this down? We could still hold the public hearing, but second and third reading shouldn't pass until the outline plan is amended. Okay. Um, and... So if we do pass this going the other way, so all three areas are now allowed one meter garage setback. Is that are we is that the same thing for all the three areas you had circled in the or outlined? So um uh, so that would be for this area here, oh. the where the the DCA twenty one application is. In these areas, there's already approved direct control districts. So we're making a change to the map within the outline plan to identify those as not just uh, residential, just to identify that they've already been approved as reduced setbacks. So reduced setback, that's for the side yard? Is that the zero lot line houses? Yes. So all those areas are planned as being zero lot line? So they've already received uh, direct control approvals. Um, except the Most of them are zero lot line, except for this area here, DCA 16. That's the one that's similar to the DCA 21. And we have no further zero lot line after this? Like I'd almost want a few years after this to see how things okay. shape up on these. I know, of course. Yeah, there's um, no there's no uh, zero lot line being proposed as this amendment. This map is just uh, this housekeeping change is just to identify where that's already been approved. Okay, okay, leave it at that for now. Okay, all right. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Clarifying questions on this one. Not seeing any. Okay, so I will uh, go to the general public on this and see if there's anybody who wants to speak in favor or opposed to the, um, the uh, outline plan amendments. Calling a second time. Not seeing anybody racing up. Okay, so uh, with that, if there's no further questions of uh, council to administration, then I will close the public hearing and we will go to business arising out of the public hearing. Uh, the motion is that council approve amendments to the Southport Ridge Meadows outline plan to identify the location of reduced setback development, as well as update the land use statistics and population calculations. Okay. And what is the wish of council? Councilor Harris? Um, <clears throat> I'd be prepared to put the motion on the table if you want to proceed at that, uh, that way at this time. Yep. Okay. So I would move that Council approve amendments to the South Fort Ridge Meadows outline plan to identify the location of reduced setback development and update the land use statistics and population calculations. Thank you. I'll accept that motion. Would you like to speak in favor of your motion? I will be voting in favor of the motion, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's open for discussion and debate. I'll just make a comment on this one. Most of it's housekeeping. It's just basically uh, approving what's, uh, what's already approved and uh, talking to the one new area that's coming forward that we'll have discussion with. So um, I think it's prudent to ensure that our area's structure plan is current and up-to-date. Councillor Kelly? Uh, thank you, Mayor Catcher. I will be voting in favor of the motion as well. I'd just like to add that I sense the concern of, of Councillor Blizzard, and I believe I share those concerns. I wouldn't like to see a whole lot more of this zero lot line and reduced setback happening until we have a, a chance in our community to see how it works out in at least in medium term, a couple to three to five years. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Council, not seeing anything else. Councillor Harris on close? Uh, no, I, I think that's fine. Okay, thank you. The motion is now closed. Please cast your vote.
and that is carried six to one. All right, thank you. So the uh, next public hearing that we will go to is for bylaw C1-23, amending land use bylaw C23-20. Um, so once again, the process for anybody just tuning in, administration will make a presentation. Following their presentation, council will have an opportunity to ask clarifying questions. Once those have been answered, administration will step to the side and we will allow for individuals to come forward to speak in favor or opposed, and those who have registered will uh, be called first to, uh, to uh, provide their feedback and be allowed five minutes. So, and uh, once that happens and everybody has their opportunity, administration will come forward, answer any final questions, and then I would close it and we would go to business arising from the public hearing. So, with that, I will uh, open the uh, next public hearing at 2.16 and invite uh, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, well, yeah, let's continue our conversation on bylaw C1-23 to amend the land use bylaw. This is the land use bylaw amendment that we were just previously mentioning in the South Fort Ridge Meadows Oatline Plan Amendment. The land use bylaw amendment is to add a new direct control district titled DCA 21, Innovative Street Oriented Medium Density Housing with Suites District. So I will go over the proposed amendment the planning framework, the recommendation and rationale, communications, and then we'll get into questions. So starting with the proposed amendment. The subject site of the proposed amendment is shown in orange. The site is located along the west side of Greenfield Link, across from the stormwater management facility in the South Ward Meadows neighborhood. For an overview of the amendment, this application was submitted by Altera Engineering on behalf of South Ford Development Corporation. And the purpose of this amendment is to enable street-oriented medium-density housing with attached rear garages on lots with significantly reduced rear yard setbacks. It introduces a new housing form to the city in the form of semi-detached suites. The proposal is to amend three areas of the land use bylaw. The first is adding a new direct control district to the land use bylaw. Uh, amending the definitions, including semi-detached housing, and adding a new definition for semi-detached suites, and a change to the map to redistrict the subject site to the proposed direct control district. So for context, I wanted to highlight what a direct control district is. A direct control district is a unique type of land use district and unlike a conventional land use district, direct controls are applied to specific areas where council wishes to exercise particular control over the use and development of land or buildings within a specific area. So they must comply to the city's statutory plans. They have customized land use designation and they include regulations that are site specific or limited to the proposed location. In this case, the direct control district would allow for semi-detached housing with suites with reduced rear yard setback requirements. And applying this as a direct control district provides the ability to evaluate this new housing form on its merits and help determine whether aspects of the concept can be applied more broadly across the city. So next I'll highlight what is within the proposed direct control district. So again, the proposed district introduces the new housing form to the city as semi-detached housing with suites. The proposal is intended to have low maintenance housing design and it's got a rear lane housing product. The garages are attached to the rear of the semi-detached houses and there are no backyards. There is common access between buildings along the side yards. Uh, as mentioned, this is a street-oriented housing product, so it will have a consistent streetscape design. The houses will have enhanced architectural features and exterior area finishings, and a minimum nine square meter outdoor amenity space is provided. The lots are designed to have that low maintenance landscaping. The proposed district is similar to a development concept introduced in 2021 with direct control district DCA 16. And this is located nearby to the north and across the street as the area highlighted in red. The main difference between these two is the proposed district would allow suites to be developed within the lower level of each unit. 
Uh, the permitted uses within the district include semi-detached housing and semi-detached suite. And the discretionary uses would be home business, home office, show home, and temporary sales center. Looking at the setbacks within the proposed district, this graphic compares the lot size and maximum building envelope of semi-detached housing. So on the left side, we've got the RC district, and on the right is the proposed district. The proposed district requires a minimum site width of 8.2 meters and 9.1 meters for corner sites. The minimum site depth is 22 meters, which you can see are shallower than the typical semi-detached housing lot depth of 34 meters. The development would have a reduced rear yard setback of one meter, which is much shorter than the typical six meter setback. The proposed district requires a side yard setback of 1.5 meters, which is similar to the RC district, and it exceeds the typical 1.2 meters that is found in the R2 district. The on-site parking is reduced compared to traditional land use districts, and it includes one stall being provided for each dwelling unit and each suite. However, due to the location, which is across from the stormwater management facility and immediately south of a park site, there's an above average amount of off-site parking. And areas of off-site parking are highlighted on this map in yellow. And there's within a 450 meters or about six meter walking area, there are, will be approximately 74 stalls along this area on the street. So since the regulations are site specific, the impacts of the reduced parking requirement can be observed on a small scale before applying any concepts of that more broadly. And the drainage, the drainage on site will be split drainage, which means it will go both to the street, Greenfield Link, and to the lane. So the high point is located near the rear of the house and water will flow away from the houses towards the shared, sh shared walkway and then water will flow to Greenfield Link and the remainder to the lane. The proposed amendment definition changes. So there would be two changes to the definitions if, with this amendment. If approved, it would be the first area in the city to allow secondary suites within semi-detached housing. So this requires an edit to the definition for semi-detached housing to remove the last sentence, which reads, this land use does not include secondary suites. Additionally, a new definition would be added for semi-detached suites. And since this new definition will only be included within the direct control district, secondary suites and semi-detached housing would not be allowed in any other district at this time. And the last change to the land use bylaw would be to the map. And uh, this is the, the subject site, which is currently zoned as urban reserve, and it would be redistricted to the proposed direct control 21 district. So now let's take a look at the planning framework. Uh, in the MDP, the subject site's designated as developing neighborhoods, and it's shown as a bright yellow color. The proposed amendment complies with the MDP policies as it supports developments that address the public realm while encouraging new and innovative housing types to address diverse community needs. The subject site's also located within the South Fort Area Structure Plan, and it's identified as medium density residential, meaning that its density is between 36 and 70 dwelling units per net residential hectare. The proposed district will meet the density requirement at 53.4 dwelling units per net residential hectare. And the subject site is located within the South Fort Ridge Meadows outline plan shown here. As, as per the South Fort ASP, outline plans are required to identify areas of the proposed, uh, of the, uh, the, sorry, required to identify the proposed location and extent of non-conventional development types, such as reduced setback development. So as illustrated on the outline plan, the subject site is designated as medium density oriented townhouses. So to reflect and reduce the reduced setback housing development, an amendment to the Southport Ridge Meadows outline plans being processed concurrently, uh, which we just passed by resolution. 
So administration is in support of this application for the following reasons. The proposed development aligns with the MDP and the South Fort Area Structure Plan. The site is suitable for higher density development as it's in proximity to open spaces and trails. The proposed built form is compatible with the surrounding area and the proposed built form demonstrates innovation and creativity and will provide a sweet option for semi-detached housing, which enables increased density while maintaining the appearance of semi-detached housing. So the public hearing was advertised in the Fort record for two consecutive weeks and properties within 100 meters were mail notified. The advertisement was posted on the city's website and social media and two written submissions were received and submitted to council. And now we'll go to questions. Great, thank you very much for your presentation. So remind everybody we are in a public hearing and this is only for clarifying questions. So um, do you have clarifying questions for administration? Councillor Kelly? Yes, thank you. Um, just allow me to scroll through and identify them on my on my iPad. The first question is from comments on page 48 of our materials, where it um, talks about the drainage swale. Uh, I would assume, based on this, that the drainage swale will be precisely where the sidewalk enters the garage door at the back of the building. And so to the front of that sidewalk, we'll have drainage to the front. To the rear, of course, will be drainage to the alley. Uh, I'm not sure of where the precise location of the swale will be, but they, they will be on either side of the shared walkway. But the walkway itself will be raised above soil level. It will act as a barrier if the swale isn't right there. And that's really my question. Okay, I think that... I don't think this... Councillor Kelly, I think the developer is here and he's registered to speak and I think you can ask him those questions if they don't have the answer. I can move on, thank you. Um, the next page, I'm just curious. Um, parks, and I, and I happen to think based on my limited landscaping experiences, has uh, suggested that mulch be excluded from the low maintenance boulevards. I'm just wondering what would be in their low maintenance boulevards if it's not mulch? Uh, Mar yeah, mulch was uh, is just, uh, not wanted in this area because it causes problems going into, uh, onto being flying onto the road and into the drainage. Um, this, the specifics of what's going to be in that area have not yet been determined. That's part of more of the development process. I will ask the developer that question as well. Thank you. Moving on, uh, there's a discussion on page 53 about Greenfield Link and how it compares to other streets. Is administration suggesting, and am I reading this right, that an 11 and a half meter carriageway with parallel parking on both sides of the street is expected to handle up to 7,000 vehicles per day? in a reduced setback setting as well? So Your Worship, I can take this one. Um, yes, we do have collector roads, which can accommodate up to 7,000 vehicles a day um, with 11.5 meter carriageway and parallel parking on both sides. The best comparison would be Woodbridge Link. For this particular road, we're anticipating um, no more than 2,500 trips per day. Okay, thank you, Janelle. So Greenfield Link then, does it extend further south as the development progresses um, for South Fort Saskatchewan? Through your worship, um, in the preliminary servicing plans we have, that is not the plan. So it's not anticipated that Greenfield Link would extend further south from that T intersection? Correct. Okay, thank you. And one last question on, on the traffic. Um, 
Allard Way currently handles approximately how many vehicles per day? Ms. Smith will answer. Uh, through your worship, uh, roughly four to 5,000. Okay, um, I have a couple more questions, if I may, Mayor Catcher, or I can take I'll a pause and come back. To yeah, me. if you can pause, I've got uh, Councillor Noya next. You bet, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Noyan. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my first question is, what, what is the advantage of this product type in comparison to what I believe is called a, a fourplex along Allard Way. I think there is a product built by Pace Setter there. They as well have two entrances. Um, the reason I'm asking this question is it would per potentially eliminate uh, if there was a, an issue with drainage. Yeah, so this development would be similar to a fourplex. It would, one of the advantages is it would allow uh, a homeowner maybe easier able to purchase it to, with the ability to rent out the suite in the bottom. So um, instead of being in like a condo, you'll have separate owners uh, for each semi um, as well. Okay, I think but I see what you're saying. To add? <laughs> uh, through you, Worship Councillor Noyan. Um, no, I think Lindsay is, has kind of hit the nail on the head. This is a different type of a concept for the city of Fort Saskatchewan um, because it does provide um, a specifically designed suite within a semi-detached and that does provide the ability to rent out. Uh, it would be designed specifically for it to be a separate dwelling unit that could be rented out, which would be different from those other units. Okay, then that that raises the question to me. This the the concept plan for this product is affordability of a, a particular unit with a, with a rental suite capacity, which we don't have in any other product type right now. That would be correct in saying that. Uh, through you, Worship, this this would be something that would be unique. So yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank I have you. a few more questions. But I can wait, yeah. We can do one more, and then I'll okay put thank you back in the list. Thank you. Uh, one more question then. Uh, I think if I counted correctly, there are 14 units in total planned for this block and then and then 74 stalls is what you you mentioned would be the park parking allowance of, of the space on the, the street. Yeah, so there's uh, would be 14 dwelling units and 14 suites and they would each all have one parking in their garage and on the street along that yellow area that I showed right. there, there would be approximately 74 parking spaces along the street. Okay, thank you. That was, that was my question. Thank you. I'll come back to you. Um, I'm next in for questions. Um, so I guess the only question that I have on this, and I asked this before, and, and if you can't answer it, I'll ask the developer when it comes up. Um, so as these are being sold or built, are they going to be built to the standard of each one will have the separate basement suite? Or if somebody decides that they want uh, it just to be a regular half of a duplex, do, do they have that option? Uh, the person who owns a semi-detached would not have to rent out the suite. They could use it for their, their own purposes, yeah. But I'm, I'm just talking about being built could it be built as though it's just got access to the basement as a regular half duplex? Yes. Okay. And I guess my next question, I'm, I'm going to go to Mr. Thomas on this one or, or yourself. Um, you know, how many, do we have any idea through the census how many um, homes that we currently have multi-family living in that that this potentially would have a benefit for instead of having people come in through a main and main part of the house because do, are we aware that there's people renting out their basements already um you worship their we, we do have basement suites within single detached housing. Um, I don't have a specific number on that, at least not off the top of my head. Um, but again, this does offer uh, a product type or a housing type that doesn't exist within the fort and it does exist within other areas within the region. So um, it does provide another option for housing within the city. Okay. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harris? Um, I'm, not, I'm 
Not sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Get my fingers moving. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure who this question should be directed to, uh, possibly Ms. Duggett Smith, but respecting that this amendment would potentially create the uh, better housing opportunity from affordability standpoint, is there an objective um, matrix that suggests what our level of affordability is in Fort Saskatchewan? Uh, because I've never had the feeling that we have an affordability issue. I know there are some people that probably are challenged <laughs> to, to, to meet that, but do we have an affordability problem? I'm, that that's just an underlying question about the need for this particular product. Uh, through you, Worship. So we use the CMHC standard, which says no more than one third of your household income should be contributed towards housing. Uh, that's the metric that we use to determine whether or not um, we have a housing issue. We did do some analysis on this back in 2019. It could be updated with the most recent census data. And it did show that we have uh, some limited supply in terms of uh, three-bedroom units. Um, and oh, Craig, I might need some assistance on this one, if you can recall. Uh, sure. Uh, through your worship to Council, Council Is my mic on? OK. Uh, through you, your worship to Councillor Harris, um, I think some of the findings that came out is we have an oversupply of uh, three bedroom housing and an under of su under supply of uh, one bedroom and studio suites. Um, so what that could suggest is there is going to be a, a range of affordability and a range of needs for housing within any community. Uh, one of the things we don't know is how many people are are leaving the city because they can't find uh, housing. Uh, to meet their needs specifically within uh, the city of Fort Saskatchewan. So that's kind of a regional dynamic that affects the city of Fort Saskatchewan. So but we don't know the extent of it. So the bottom line of my question is this adds a unique twist to our affordability stock. That's correct. It would help okay. for sure. Thanks. Thank you. I'll go back to Councillor Kelly. You're first on round two. Thank you. Um, probably, Mr. Thomas. Um, Craig, my comment is in relation to Appendix D, page 55 of our materials, and I believe it's the very last paragraph in Appendix D, where you reference the fact that the developer intends to landscape the block following construction, include, including the boulevard and the yards. You go on, though, and this is where my question arises, to say that requiring improvements to privately owned land through development agreement would establish a new standard and would warrant a legal review. From a, from a layman's perspective, why aren't we negotiating this stuff? It doesn't have to be cast in stone within the, the land use bylaw. Okay. Um, it's negotiated over and above okay. with the developer at the time. So that's my question. Why not just negotiate and, and leave it at that? Why do we need that comment? Mr. Thomas? Um, through your worship to uh, Councillor Kelly, I'll try to answer this as best I can. Um, what the land use bylaw is, it does, it, it's a bit of a challenge simply because uh, land use bylaw would regulate what happens on uh, private property uh, and anything that's done, um, say, on the street or within the right of way. So that would include the landscape boulevard. Uh, would have to be uh, incorporated through a development agreement. Um, so that has a separate process that we would go through, um, but it would be separate from the land use bylaw. It would be part of the subdivision itself. So if I understood you correctly then, the negotiation of the agreement wouldn't necessarily then establish a new standard and warrant a legal review. Uh, through you, Worship, um, it, uh, it, it may or may not, we'd have to work through that process. Okay. I'm going to think about your answer and I'll, I'll come back to you in, uh, after the motion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Noyan. Clarifying questions. Yeah. Just one last question. Uh, what level of completion will the build out be for the suite, uh, upon turning over, uh, the, the unit to, to the, the new owner? 
do do we know that do we discuss that with the developer um, and I'm, the reason I'm asking my question is the the topic of affordability of housing comes up and a lot of you know basements are are turned over to owners in, in various levels of completion let's say uh, from from roughed in to uh, framed um, so I'm, I'm wondering what type of costs could be incurred by a new owner of of one of these units uh, so the land use bylaw doesn't say when it would be sold so um, they could once it's rezoned it could be sold or once it's subdivided it could be sold or once it's built so um, that that would be determinant on the landowner when, when they wish to sell it Does by by the builder do you mean or uh, the landowner so the, when they whatever that would be owned by the builder at the, the point of sale i suppose right is what i'm saying uh, it, it might be. Or in most instances, I, I would think. Ms. Smith, do you worship? The basement could be left unfinished. Right. Okay. So, okay. Good enough. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. I have uh, one more question. Uh, it may be for Mr. Thomas or Ms. Smith. Um, so, as we talk about our densities, uh, um, as these will have a separate suite, number one, will they have, sep if approved, would they have a separate address? So that's the first question. And then the second question, because it would be considered a separate residential dwelling um, under our density targets, would we be able to consider those and, and uh, put those in so that it actually makes that a higher density than um, saying that we just have one resident whole unit per hectare, there would actually be the two. You understand? Yeah, so the addressing would not be separate. Um, it would probably be like A or B type of thing. And um, uh, so what was the second part again? About the density, About because the density. we have a density target. So would this would this help or, or alleviate some of the, the uh, challenges that we have with density and free up, you know, some of the other areas? Do we know that? So uh, suites are not calculated as part of density. So um, the, the the 14 units are included in the density calculation, but not the suites. Is that consistent through the EMRB? That's been our approach in the city of Fort Saskatchewan uh, because sometimes suites can be taken away from that. So, so say you have one of these semi-detached units with a suite um, and you rent it out for a couple of years and then you decide you don't want to, you need more space, then it sort of becomes one unit again. So that's why one of the reasons they're not calculated. Your Worship, maybe I can add a little bit to it. Um, it it's, a, it's an excellent question and I think that it's one that's been uh, interpreted differently among different municipalities um, and the reason being and just to give an example of a typical single detached house um, whether it's it's new or something that's existing but there's always that opportunity to apply for and develop a suite within the basement sometimes it's just a matter of you take the lock off the door and it's no longer a suite and you're not renting out out anymore so it's very difficult to capture that as part of density. You can approve a basement suite within a house. You don't know if it's being rented out, if it's being uh, used as a suite uh, into the future. So it's very hard to incorporate that. Um, I think that some municipalities, if there is a suite that is approved, then they, they do count that in the density. Um, this particular application is is quite unique because it's designed in a particular way it doesn't have a set of stairs within the dwelling unit that goes right to the basement you have actually have to go into the garage in order to get uh, down to the basement so it it's a it kind of straddles both realms so to speak but because it is a suite um, we're or it's it it's being uh, called a suite um, it at this time it's not being considered as part of the density calculation okay so last question that I'll ask you so um, then my question would be so that's something that we need to get consistency on on the growth plan as we're doing our updates uh, correct I think as we move forward we'll have to tease it out a little bit more and and get a better handle on it for sure okay 
Thank you. Councillor Harris? Um, I think Councillor Kelly touched on the issue of the sidewalk development uh, serving these two buildings, if you're assuming one shared sidewalk. Um, so there's one and a half meter setback from the property line to the edge of the dwelling unit, right? And so ultimately you've got a nine meter side yard, combined side yard. Three meters. Three meters, sorry. Okay. So is that not big enough to be able to build a sidewalk adjacent to the footing of the building as opposed to putting it down the middle of the property line and to have the drainage channel going down the middle of that? Is that just too tight? Because I look at it from the standpoint of saying, I, I just, I think I share Councillor Kelly's concerns. Drainage it needs to be well thought out. And so um, is that enough? <clears throat> Can you do it that way as opposed to a shared sidewalk? Yeah, and I'll, I'll also let uh, the developer talk about this one a little bit more, but the si si shared sidewalk is designed in the middle so that they can have more space for the window wells for the suites within the basement. Okay, good point. But I'll look forward to uh, Mr. Usenick's comments. Thanks. Okay, great. That looks like... Uh, all of the questions. Councillor Kelly, did you have any other questions before I move on? Thank you, Mary Catcher, not at this moment. Okay, thank you. So I will thank administration. We have one person registered at this time, but others uh, who are sitting here would also have an opportunity after. Uh, as I indicated, those who are registered have uh, first opportunity to come forward. And uh, so I'll just have the two of you take a seat. So, and uh, Mr. Usnick uh, has registered. And so, because we are being video streamed, I'll have you state your name. If you're in favor or opposed, you can get your um, presentation up and then you will have five minutes and then questions. Perfect. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of council. My name is Andrew Usnick and I'm with South Ford Development Corporation speaking in favor of the bylaw. Before I discuss our proposal, I think it's important to reflect on DC 16 for the members of council that were not part of that approval. As the administration presented, this is an approved and partially constructed development that is directly adjacent. Here is a construction photo from November compared to the 3D renders. All of the landscaping on these units will be xeriscaped, meaning they do not require the use of a lawnmower to maintain. They are a combination of artificial turf, trees, shrubs, and mulch. With no backyard, one of the key selling features of these units was reduced maintenance, which we felt was appealing to some markets such as empty nesters, shift workers, single parents, etc. One of the questions from first reading was around the timing of landscaping completion. The intent of DC 21, similar to DC 16, is that all of the landscaping would be completed at once by the builder to ensure consistency. That work is built into the price of the unit and is not something an owner can opt out of. I also want to add a construction photo taken last fall to help illustrate the reasons why we created this new housing product in this specific location. With the South Fort Meadows Park directly adjacent to DC 16 and 21, despite not having a backyard, residents will have access to a large outdoor amenity only steps away. This, along with increased street parking opportunities, is fundamental to these proposals. Plainly put, we do not think it would work elsewhere in our community. In 2021, Council approved the City's Municipal Development Plan. We paid very close attention to those discussions because this is the document that outlines Council's vision for future development in the Fort. One of the conclusions that Administration presented was that the City is currently underserved for one-bedroom rental units, and that deficit would grow if supply was not added as the City developed. That got us to thinking on how we could deliver on the city's goal to add supply while still building a housing product that the market would accept. Which brings us to our proposal today. The concept behind DC 21 is similar to DC 16. Lots with reduced depth to allow a rear attached garage and zero scape yard to reduce maintenance. The difference is we've added a secondary suite to the basement of, to create 14 potential one bedroom rental units. To accommodate this, the design of the garage is changed to allocate an attached single car garage to the unit and to the secondary suite. In order to create an inviting and functional side entrance for the secondary suites, 
We have increased the minimum side yard setback and designed a shared walkway. Just to reiterate a point made by administration, the proposal tonight does not contemplate changing the density of the proposed area. This also aligns with the approved area structure plan that calls for medium density housing in this location. We're simply proposing a new innovative housing product to execute the same plan. It's also worth mentioning that in 2022, Council approved the zoning for the undeveloped lands directly west of tonight's proposal to allow for triple car garage housing product. The overwhelming majority of housing product adjacent to the South Fort Meadows Park will continue to be triple car garage product. But this is a way to further our shared goal to incorporate a variety of housing forms in the community in a way that is thoughtful and transitions appropriately. There are a few comments and questions about parking during first reading. We understand Council's priority on parking within residential communities. The location of this proposal is intentional based on the facts that it fronts onto a collector road that has a wider road right of way than a local road to accommodate parking on both sides. Furthermore, since there are no driveways converging onto either side of the road, there is an unobstructed opportunity for parking on both sides of the road. We typically do not see opportunities like this elsewhere in our neighborhood. You can see on my slide there, we're showing 62 opportunities. That includes the on-site private uh, garage stalls, whereas the number that administration uh, provided earlier was just street parking, but also included Greenfield Link north of directly across from these units. This allows us to have parking on private property within the garage, but also provides a surplus of street parking options that can accommodate households with multiple vehicles, guests, etc. Being mindful of time, the time I have to speak, I'm going to conclude my presentation there, but I do want to make you aware that I have prepared additional slides that can hopefully help me answer any additional questions uh, the council may have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, and you're one minute under, so uh, thank you. <laughs> so we will open it up to uh, questions of council for Mr. Usnick, and I know there was a couple indicated they were going to ask Councillor Harris. Um, Mr. Usnick, you heard my question about the uh, sidewalk and drainage and whatnot. Drainage on these narrow lots is obviously something that's a challenge to develop and it's even more of a challenge to maintain going forward because it becomes a private domain issue. So what, what are your thoughts in relation to this relative to the overall structure of those units that you're proposing to, uh, to develop? Yeah, I was anticipating this question, so I do have some slides prepared. So, so first of all, um, just to clarify, these lots are actually not narrow. They're actually wider than typical lots. Um, so the drainage functions similar to any other typical house where you've got uh, grade away from the dwelling that takes overland flow to the property line, which is the hypothetical uh, low point. Um, as administration presented, um, it was mentioned at first reading that these lots were back to front draining. Actually, they're split lots. So you can see here, this is just a screenshot from the engineering drawings. So the high point along the property line is, is reasonably close to that rear, um, uh, pardon me, the side entrance on these units. So um, this is an exaggerated sketch just so that council can kind of understand. But, but essentially, water drains away from the dwellings to that property line. For the water that flows to the front of the lot, it'll be conveyed out through the shared walkway. And there's no walkway that actually extends out to the alley. So after that point where there's the side access there, that will all be soft landscaping. So we actually think that in terms of strictly drainage, this proposal functions much better than any other typical housing product in Fort Saskatchewan because you have that three meters in between the houses and because we only have one shared walkway at about 1.2 meters, you've got the remaining uh, 1.8 meters of soft landscaping that will absorb flow as it comes. And in this case, as administration mentioned, if you had concrete on both sides abutting up to the house, you've got issues with window wells. And when we're talking about having basement suites, it's really important to have strong natural light going into those units. So you want to have you know, larger than normal window wells in order to be able to create a much more livable space. So essentially, we didn't want to turn the side yard into a sea of concrete. Of course, it needs to be something that functions properly on a drainage perspective, but we feel that this 
not only functions well, but aesthetically is quite a bit more pleasing. And when we're talking about intentionally designing basement suites, we don't want it to feel like an afterthought. We don't want it to feel like a shameful secret that you're hiding you know, people in there. We want it to have the same kind of dignity as a front entrance to a normal house. Yeah, I understand that. From Just strictly from a construction standpoint, then you're talking about the sidewalk is then going to be a conveyance device or mechanism to get uh, waterfront back. Yeah, the same way that a sidewalk on public property or even a road on public property, you may be familiar in, in some parts of Fort Saskatchewan. I know I can think of a few in our community. There's concrete swales at the back of lots. Mm -hmm. I, and, and so that's essentially the same kind of concept here because in areas where the slope is, um, you know, we'll, we'll say shallow, engineering will often ask the developer to build a concrete swale to better convey that water once it gets to that, you know, rear property line. So again, you know, in our experience, that works very well as a conveyance when we're talking about you get the water to the property line and that concrete walk will do a better job expediting the water to where it needs to go. So last question along that line. So in other words, the neighbors adjacent to one another are going to have to become good neighbors and figure out how they're going to maintain care and maintenance of that sidewalk. There's going to be a, a, an easement registered on that because it's shared infrastructure. Okay. Th those rules need to be in place and registered on title. Good point. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kelly. Oh, thank you, and good afternoon, Andrew. I'm going to touch on the questions that I asked of administration. The first one, as a developer in the area, do you see Greenfield Link extending further south from its current proposed terminus with further development, or is that the extent of Greenfield Link? Uh, Councillor, can I just clarify, do you mean further south in the annexation area? Well, further south from where it shows in the drawings that we were given. And, sure. and the reason I asked that, Andrew, is I'm concerned about traffic volumes on it. So the longer the roadway, the higher the traffic volume. So, Yeah, so so I think I can answer that answer. with this slide uh, that I've pulled up now. So this is uh, the marketing plan for our community. So if you see where my cursor is, that's essentially the intersection just south of our proposal today. So Greenfield Link extends down to South Ridge Boulevard. Um, as touched on in a previous public hearing, uh, as soon as we develop one more lot in this area, that triggers the construction of this entire road. South, the, right now, the intersection terminates at South Ford Drive and South Ridge Boulevard. We build one more lot and Southridge Boulevard will be extended all the way to this new access, which is then Greenfield Link, which then connects up to where we're talking about uh, tonight. So that's the termination point for Greenfield Link and it will be supported by a major collector that we will be constructing. Regarding the lands south of that in the annexation area, um, we have uh, observed the proposed uh, design brief for the annexation area. And at the current time, they are proposing that this road does not continue on as a collector south of this location. They're proposing a collector connection uh, going south closer to where my cursor is now. So whether this becomes a local road with traffic calming moving south from here or if it's just not extended period I, I can't speak to that right now just because that's uh, more of an administrative exercise that's going on in the annexation area but in terms of our neighborhood that's where Greenfield Link terminates and connects to the major collector road being Southridge Boulevard. Andrew thank you I understand um, good answer. Uh, the, the landscaping for the <clears throat> excuse me the boulevard in this new development You've indicated and administration indicated that it will be landscaped by the builder as part of the process. And I appreciate that. I, the question revolves around, is that just something offered by the developer or was it negotiated? Why can it not be negotiated? Uh, why does it have to be so formal? Can you shed some light on that for me, please? I can't speak to the formality of it and the legality of it. That's a little out of my uh, subject matter. I mean, for us, it was an intentional choice because we saw a market there. And certainly that was validated through DC-16 and our experience, and more specifically, the experience our builders had. So, you know, 
the feedback we received from from the market was while it's not for everyone there is a market that really likes this zero scape concept in the in in the idea of of still having something that's green and beautiful and lush but not necessarily something that you need to cut the lawn every week or two so um for us it's just been market dependent um and and that's kind of what's leaving us towards this whether there needs to be an additional administrative portion of it I can't speak to that, but for us, I mean, selfishly speaking, we're going to deliver what the market wants, and, and the market has kind of shown that this this concept has some legs. And I won't argue that, Andrew. Thank you. Um, one last comment slash question for yourself. The question of window wells. It's my understanding that the building code was changed within the last few years, at least, to require deeper, wider window wells to allow for easier egress, exit, pardon me, egress from a basement area in case of a fire. Is that the case? And I, I assume that's why then that they, we we're restricted to a single sidewalk as, as in this particular situation. Uh, Councillor, that's correct. And, and I believe there's another step in the building code coming here shortly. And there will continue to be quite a few up until 2030. So, um, I mean, Building code or not, it's an important function for us just because of the basement suite. Because if you build something that's not livable, well, then the market will say, thanks for, for offering it to us, but we're not interested. Okay, you're good. And I can come back to you on a round two if you need it. I think I'm good, Mayor Catcher. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Blizzard. Um, it was brought up the affordability was a big thing here. So what would be the price point for these units? Uh, that's a tough question to answer just because over the past 18 months, the uh, fluctuation in materials and labor's pricing has been quite erratic. And uh, a lot of projects where you've forecasted a certain number. I mean, as a land developer, we don't actually physically build these units. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really difficult for me to commit to that. Um, if I'm being honest with you, when we first conceptualized this concept, um, interest rates were close to zero and it wasn't necessarily on top of our mind on, on, on that but as as nine interest rates have changed and we've started to see buyers who thought that they could buy their own duplex or single family home and then they go to the bank and realize what they can actually afford based on these interest rate changes it's kind of been a convenient uh, you know circumstance in the sense of like whoa this is one way to be able to offset some of those mortgage payments and get certain people into home ownership that otherwise couldn't so I can't quantify that in terms of an actual final price, um, but certainly that is going to be a selling point compared to other duplexes on the market that don't have that option. There are some, you said, just up the road that are similar to this, but don't have the basement suite. What do they go for? Do you know? Those would have sold last year, and I believe the range would have been mid to high 300,000s. Yeah. Okay, and the other question I had was the 62 parking spots you had. You said that included the garages, right? Yes. Did the, and maybe the city also, um, did you take into account the size of vehicles? Because I know when I drive around, I would say more than every second vehicle is an extended cab pickup. So, you know, when you drew that out, did you take that into account as a smart car or as a... <laughs> no, completely fair question. And actually, going back to our presentation on... DC-16, the, the version without um, the basement suites, one of the uh, additional um, you know, differences in that unit is what we were doing a 22-foot wide garage, whereas typically a lot of double car garages you're seeing built today are 18 or 20. And the reason being, we felt that that extra two feet was fundamental to be able to fit those larger truck vehicles into the, the garage. So the garage side is actually ex the same with here, we, we haven't reduced it down to, to 20 feet total. It's just demised into the two units now. So two single garage doors, which might make it tough, right? Because the garage doors are going to be you're, you're gonna limiting have, the You're, you're, you're going to have your plywood and you're going to drywall on top of that. So you definitely lose a few inches based on that. But still, as a single car garage, it is going to be able to accommodate a full-size truck for sure. Okay. And how about length? Because it didn't, I was looking at them, it didn't show the length of the garage, or yeah, not that the, I saw. The, the length is the same as well. When we actually presented DC-16, we actually had 
two pictures of two F-150s kind of conveniently put mm -hmm. in there so that we could demonstrate both width and length. You could have two F-150s in the same household in the same garage. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. I'm going to jump in because you've got the slide that's sitting on there. Uh, so two questions. So with the arena or the outdoor rink that's there, uh, is there actually parking? I can't remember the diagram. Is there actually? I'm yes, seeing heads. there is no. going to be private parking, a parking block constructed here. Um, we don't consider that in any of our parking calculations just because, but, but, to answer your question, yes, there is a hypothetical parking opportunity there as well. Okay. And second question. So with the lane product, the houses to that side of it, the the back side of it, is that, yeah, is the ones on the right side, is that going to be lane product or is that going to be fenced? No, that's going to be a lane product. In, in the city of Fort Saskatchewan, when you build a rear lane, you're required to have rear access on both sides okay. just to basically have an efficient use of the infrastructure. Okay, that's all I have. All right, Councillor Noyan. Thanks for responding to all of these questions today, Mr. Eusting. I appreciate your enthusiasm for this type of product. It's good to see people again. <laughs> you know, there you go. <laughs> Uh, so I, I want to touch back on uh, affordability, what's been happening with cost of construction, interest rates, and how that could affect this product. Um, not necessarily the marketability of it, but the con maybe the consumption at, as as an affordable product, and, and if we're if we're considering that that is what it's going to be. Uh, so I'll refer back to uh, the, a question that I asked uh, administration, which is uh, discussions that potentially you have probably had with builders uh, of construction completion of uh, of uh, com completion of basement suites. So I'm wondering because it's going to cost a, a significant amount more to build out a complete basement suite so that somebody has use of it to Your potentially question? rent or uh yeah okay yeah uh so so what <laughs> i lost my train of thought um i think you're going to ask about the timing of the construction of the basement's actual inside the unit is that correct yeah i'd like to know that and is that the consideration in the affordability of of the unit yeah Thank so, you. so yes, in speaking to the builder, the intent here is to build out all the basements and not leave any of them unfinished. Okay. So hypothetically, um, you would save construction cost by, by having that space unfinished. But, um, you know, when you're talking about building these 14 units and having, um, you know, when we're talking about challenges in, in costs, one of the things to bring those down is having scale and efficiency. And so when you're building 14 units and you're finishing 14 basements, there's some efficiencies there. So, you know, the builder is, is very committed to this idea. And, and so the intent is the basement suites are going to be completed with construction initially. Okay, good to know. Um, thank you very much. And I think I'll leave it at that, thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Blizzard has one more question. So these units, are they going to, oops, so these units, are they going to be all built together, like on spec? You're not waiting for them to be sold? That is correct. As a matter of fact, Councillor, I would say the majority of the houses built in Fort Saskatchewan these days are, are, are built on spec, you know, because of the uncertainty. And maybe, I'm not trying to be hysterical about the interest rate specifically, but buyers these days are really conscious about the fact that they need to have something that's going to be ready within the next 90 to 120 days. Typically, builders a few years ago were able to build a house within four or five months, and now you'd be lucky to see a builder completing something within 10 months. So the uncertainty of that, I mean, we still see a lot of pre-sales in the triple car garage product because that's the kind of product where people are really highly customizing and really making it their forever home. But otherwise, you know, uncertainty on timing is such a huge deciding factor in options. And, and there are, of course, lots of options in the market you can purchase. So we're just seeing a lot of builders going that spec route and really trusting the fact that they know what people want and, and they're building what people want to buy and, and taking on that risk, for lack of a better description. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. I see counts. Councillor Kelly has another question. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Andrew, I noted in the description of this development that the roof leaders were to be, were to be tied to the stormwater system, which is a positive in my mind. I believe Edmonton has that requirement for its new subdivision. So my question of you is, as a developer, why doesn't Fort Saskatchewan 
tie all of the roof leaders into storm sewer and build a storm sewer to handle. Thank you. Well, that's a big question. Um, so I would say um, the, the, the limiting factor there is there are certain developed communities that had engineering design briefs and, and pawn sizes size based on the fact that there would be overland flow. And overland flow is a good thing because when overland flow goes through vegetation, it's naturally treated. So by the time the water actually gets into the facility, it's, it's a very good environmental process in terms of um, you know, improving the quality of our water. For a product like this, where the site coverage is, is more intense than other housing products, I firmly endorse the idea of in adding those roof leaders into the underground system. Just because so much of the storm water is collected on the roof of the house and being able to get it into that system as soon as possible, in my opinion, has a large benefit. But I have spoken to many en engineers at many municipalities who make the point to me that if the site coverage isn't quite as intense, the environmental aspects are just as important to have as much overland flow going through that natural drainage uh, path to be treated. So I think it's two levers that you're kind of pulling and it's it's a question of where your priorities lie. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer and so if you're asking me for a broad statement on engineering practices for the entire city, I think there needs to be a discussion on when something is this dense or the site coverage is this intense, we should be utilizing roof leader uh, as our standard practice. However, when we're dealing with less dense product, maybe we use the benefit of that overland flow, but um, your engineering staff would probably have a better answer than me, even though I rambled on there for a few minutes. Well, really what I was looking for, Andrew, was a response from the developer's perspective on what it would take to accommodate, accommodate roof leaders into the stormwater system as a policy. What it would take is council direction, and when you are designing a new community, all of your underground no, no. infrastructure is sized for that. So from a developer's perspective, what difference does it make to you, the developer, if in fact that becomes the policy of Fort Saskatchewan? And I'm not saying it will, but if it should. It just means that we size our infrastructure uh, appropriately based on how drainage is going to operate. And any rough idea as to what that would lead for additional cost on a per lot or per unit basis? Off the top of my head, I wouldn't have that number. Would it be significant? Uh, I would say in the grand scheme of things, when we're talking about underground infrastructure, uh, the largest cost is digging the hole and backfilling the hole. Thank you. I think you addressed it good enough. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That looks like all the questions for you. So thank you for your presentation and answering the questions. The floor is now open for anybody else who would like to come and speak in favor or opposed to uh, bylaw C1-23. So give your first call for that. I'll give a second call for anybody who wishes to speak in favor or opposed. Okay, we have somebody approaching. Yep, you can sit in that seat. And same process, uh, I'll have to, because we're video streamed, have you state your name. And if you're in favor or opposed, and then you are got five minutes. I won't take five minutes. My name is Keith Spallon. I live on Starling Way, which I don't have access to those. But um, the new development that is just opening up, that the developer has just started to sell houses now with a zero clearance and that, uh, parking will be an issue in that. Right now, it looks to me like three units have been sold uh, at night, three units have a vehicle parked in front. One unit has a vehicle also parked across the street. Now you also, um, north of that, on Meadowview Drive, you built a whole bunch of other units with garages at the back. I took a trip down there 
uh, yesterday, last night, about 10 o'clock, and 31 vehicles were parked on the side of the road. Now, these guys have double garages, and from what I know about some of it, the garages are full of stuff. So when you go to this other place again, you say you have 62 parking units out of the 14, probably 10 have their place full of stuff. They will park on the street. Now, if in turn you have teenagers, they will park on the street. If it's a husband and wife, each have a vehicle, they will park on the street. And pretty soon there's not going to be any parking at all. And that will reduce your access into the park because nobody can get in there. There's nobody can park beside it. So I think your parking issue needs to be relooked at. And I would like to ask the developer, when will Greenfield Link be pushed all the way through in that we only have one egress out of our area right now? And that is north. And if there was a calamity at the corner, we could not get out if we were told to evacuate. So that's all. Okay, I'll see if anybody has any questions for you. And you were opposed? I am opposed to the... Okay, I'm sorry, I was just looking at Miss Axley because I don't think you'd actually stated it. Did so. I not state that? I'm sorry. I don't think so. <laughs> um, all right, so I'll see if there's any questions for you. So the only question, so with the developer's uh, presentation, did he answer your question about when the extra egress will be built out? No. Uh, he said when when something is built, but uh, that's we don't know. Okay. If, if this were to fall through, then that egress would never be built. Okay, when administration comes back up to do... Um, the final questions. I'll just make sure that uh, they they answer that once again. Hopefully, they can based on what uh, he had indicated. Okay. okay. Are there any other questions of Mr. Spallon? Not seeing any. All okay. right. Thank you very much for coming out this afternoon. Are there any others who wish to speak in favor or opposed? Second call. Okay. Not seeing any. Then I will invite uh, Lindsay and, and Craig back. And we're still in the public hearing, so final questions. So based on Mr. Spallon uh, didn't have an interpretation of when that roadway will be built other than um, when they put the next shovel in the ground, I guess. Do you have an indicator or a time frame? Yeah, so um, the, that will be included within the development agreement for this uh, DCA 21 area. And it's anticipated that that would be next summer. 2023 or 2024? 2024. Not till 2024. Okay, thank you. Are there any additional questions of administration? Okay, not seeing any. I will close the public hearing at uh, 318. So we will go directly into business arising from the public hearing. So you may go ahead. All right, uh, the motion is that council gives second reading to bylaw C1-23 to amend land use bylaw C23-20 by A, adding direct control administration district DCA 21 innovative street oriented medium density housing with suites district regulations. B, amending the semi-detached housing definition in part two administration procedures and enforcement administration section 2.6 use definitions. C, adding semi-detached suite definition in part two, administration procedures and enforcement administration, section 2.6, use definitions. And D, redistricting southeast uh, quarter section 1954-22 west of the 4th Meridian from 
Urban Reserve to DCA 21, Innovative Street Oriented Medium Density Housing with Suites District. And striking the last line. Yes, striking the last line. Okay. Just so we make sure we have that cleaned up. Uh, before I go to the motion, are there any, uh, any additional questions? Otherwise, uh, would somebody like to put a motion on? Councillor Macon. I'll make the motion that council give second reading to bylaw C1-23 to amend land use bylaw C2320 as presented, or do you want me to read it all? <laughs> she read it all. Excellent. So, yeah, so as presented, we'll be fine. Okay. Um, thank you. I'll accept that motion. Would you like to uh, speak to your motion? Um, I'd just like to thank administration and our developer for coming out today. I think that they both really made really clear and concise presentations. They didn't have too many uh, questions that weren't answered through that. Um, I am in support of this. I think it is a great addition to our community. And I know that parking is an issue everywhere, um, but I think that the developer made a good point when he said that this type of product doesn't fit anywhere else in the community. So I think that they are really taking it and putting it in the place uh, where it can find success. Um, and I'm excited for this and hope that council will approve it. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. It's open for discussion and debate. Councillor Kelly. Thank you. I do have another question of administration. Uh, there was reference made, Mr. Usenik made reference to potentially a parking lot or within the proposed the playground that will be built across the street. Can administration confirm whether or not there will in fact be um, a parking lot off the street to access the skating rink and, and the playground facilities. Yes, there will be a parking lot there. Okay, thank you. And will that parking lot be posted to prohibit overnight parking? Mr. Fl oh, Mr. Thomas, I just see heads all over. Uh, Your Worship, I might uh, either defer to um, Ms. Smith Duguid or Mr. Fleming. Um, through your worship, that is a detail that we haven't worked out at this time. I think if it was a problem, then we would uh, for sure put up signage, but typically we don't. Okay, thank you. I think we've already done that with a few of the parking lots in the community, so it's not something new. Um, I'll support the motion. I understand completely the, the concern over parking. I share those concerns. I would ask that administration monitor this development and as it comes to fruition and uh, be prepared sometime in the future to advise council on, on how it worked out and, and uh, what their observations were, if any. I, I, uh, the the on-site on parking lot for the playground, I think, will alleviate perhaps some of the concerns expressed by the individual who spoke. Um, I think... It's not hard, let me rephrase that, it's not hard for me to anticipate that there is a demand for this type of housing. I can see it within the community, just I can imagine that it would exist within the community. So, so on that basis, I'll support it. I, I uh, look forward to monitoring it and um, form an opinion a couple of years down the road once it's complete and, and see how it actually works out in the long term. Again, thank you to everybody participated in it. I thought it was a well-reasoned and, and practical approach to the problem. Okay, Thanks again. Thank you. Councillor Blizzard on discussion and debate. Yeah, now that we can state opinions instead of just questions, I do have kind of a rhetorical question, but should we be promoting on-street parking? I don't like the idea. In the winter when we have snow, if those streets are filled with parks, with people parking, where does the snow go? You can't have a plow going quickly down. Um, when we do have now all of a sudden snow, um, you tell them to move. We have to haul the snow so that we can, they can go back and park. Even if there's boulevards, it's a tough one. Um, I really, one thing I really don't like with this one is the one meter behind the garage. If that still kept the enough room for a car, 
you know, I could understand it because I've gone through some of these neighborhoods where there's one and then the pickup comes behind and still tries to park across for a little bit. If that's done and there's a neighbor behind or someone going down the alley, they have a hard time. Um, yeah, I just see there's going to be parking issues and maybe it'll pass anyways, but I don't support this for mainly the parking. The product itself, no offense, I'm sure the builders, it'll look nice, um, but I, I just see lots of issues coming with the parking for many, many reasons. And I definitely think we need a sign in that parking lot saying no overnight. We already had that issue in one parking lot. This would be one where nobody is there that might need to leave their car overnight. If you know That should not be used for residents to stay overnight to park their cars permanent so the parking lot should be kept for people going to the playground or what is not where the rink is getting built to yeah so you know that should be left for the people that going there um, but anyways I'm not in support because of the parking issues okay thank you I'm next and then Councillor Noyan so we, we've had a lot of education about what's happening in the future. And it was quite inspiring to me because really I think what I heard is tomorrow isn't like yesterday. We have to look and see what's happening in the future. And those people who have bought their homes maybe in West Park or some of the other areas where we've got the 55 by 150 foot lots, the reality is there's gonna be less, less of those being built as we move forward but they become move up homes. And I think, you know, I think what this does is it will help attract, you know, our demographics by the decisions that we make. And if, if this weren't to be approved, it actually limits the demographics. You know, I think, you know, when, when I listened to uh, the mayor of Carmel who came out and spoke to us and, and he talked about the fact that, you know, you have to have diversity in housing, that there has to be, you know, abilities for um, families so uh, nowadays while the millenniums they said were living at home till they were like 35 or something and we don't know what the next generation is but for some of them they may not want to live in the common uh, area with with their parents and they may want to live in the basement suite or if you can't afford afford the home but you want to get into home ownership it does provide an option I know we're not Vancouver and I know they're not million dollar homes but you know when when I watch a lot of uh, the real estate shows about um, about affordability sometimes that's the only way that gives people an opportunity to take that step into getting into owning a home and really I think we have to just remember we're, we're building for tomorrow generation as well and um, you know at one point in time I probably might have been opposed to this but I think as we continue to educate ourselves our councils and and the general public about what you know we're, we're positioning ourselves for the future um, I will support this and I think you know we have to look at the innovation and we do rely on um, our planning department to help us understand what's helping we don't want to be cookie cutter that's what we've said but we do want to make sure that we aren't limiting our demographics as we move forward so I will be supportive and I do thank uh, administration for the education that you continue to provide us thank you Councillor Noyan. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll try to keep my discourse rather brief. I, I do share, even though I haven't discussed discussed it personally, the the concerns with drainage along the side yard. Having worked in these type of yards uh, or, or narrower yards with with swales, and, and I know that we were given an exaggerated um, uh, a sketch of of a, a split uh, split drainage for the yards. I what I see foresee happening in these yards, but we can take winter as an example, is that any snow that accumulates, and if it's a, a winter of large snowfall, snow that accumulates on the sidewalk is going to be pushed onto the houses. This will crack foundation walls over time, and I, and I don't think that's of, of any um, debate in, in, in my mind. Um, the, the other concerns I, I have, and it do include parking, uh, it, was, it was suggested in, in applications a year ago uh, that that having on street parking and 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 also um, activating a, a street with uh, with with front front yard space uh, is 
is actually a traffic calming measure. And I see this product type as as a tool for traffic calming as well. Um, that's something that, that I see in a way as going not, not entirely against, but uh, it, it conflicts with our, our Vision Zero approach uh, to the city for, for our roadways. Um, for, those, for those two reasons, I, I'm not going to be voting in favor of, of this product, um, although I, I do appreciate the merits of, of, of what it encompasses and, and what it could be. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harris on discussion and debate. Um, I, I think this is pretty straightforward in my mind. I support the uh, proposal. Uh, I think it's a, a pretty good development concept, and this is a great opportunity to put it into uh, into play to give it an opportunity to look and see how it works within the context that it will be situated. Um, so I support it from that standpoint. Um, we are a car-oriented society. Uh, we have to have roads, and cars get parked on roads. I think that's just the way it is. It's public domain, and that's what it's for. I, I, I really don't have a concern with the parking at all. I think it'll work itself out in due course. So I'll support the uh, bylaw. Okay, thank you. Not seeing anyone else on debate. Councillor Macon, would you like to close? Yeah, thank you for the comments, everybody. Um, I do think that the benefits of this development do outweigh some of the challenges uh, that we perceive to uh, maybe happen. Uh, so I continue to support this. And um, I just, I really think that over the last couple of years, we've really seen a change in what's being brought forward to council and really seeing um, diverse communities being built, you know, where we're seeing truly different types of housing being built in areas. So um, I do uh, like this product for this area and I think it will add to the diversity of the community. Okay, thank you. The motion is now closed for second reading. Please cast your vote. Motion is carried five to two. Would you like to continue with third? Councillor Macon? We have to do third reading. There we go. I'll make the motion that Council give third reading to bylaw C1-23 to amend land use bylaw C2320 as presented. Thank you. Do you have anything further to speak in favor? I do not. Is there further discussion and debate? Not seeing or hearing any. I'm going to close the motion. Please cast your vote. Motion is carried five to two. Thank you very much. Um, it's 3.30. I like to take breaks at about an hour and a half just so that we have a little bit of comfort. So we'll take a 10 minute break and then we will resume. So we are in recess till 3.40. Ish. Ish.
Okay, if we can get everybody to, uh, I'm going to uh, call this back to order. All right. Okay, so the next item that we have is request for council administration for new area structure plan in the future urban area. Craig Thomas in person and Sheree Cindy, Cindy, Shindy, sorry, uh, virtually. Welcome. Thank you, Worship. Members of Council, my name is Craig Thomas. I'm also joined by Sri Shindi, who's uh, joining us virtually. Also here is Chuck McNutt from WSP Global. And I also believe that Mike Yoakum is here from Landrex as well, both of whom are available to uh, answer questions if Council has any specifically for them. So the purpose of today's presentation is to provide information to Council regarding a request to authorize the preparation of a new area structure plan within the future urban area, also known as the uh, annexation area. So to get us started, uh, area structure plans are key planning documents uh, for the development of the city and it serves two purposes. It refines and implements the city's broad planning objectives and policies of the Municipal Development Plan and other policies by promoting logical, compatible and sustainable development. Also, it guides and directs the specific land use, subdivision and development decisions that collectively determine the form uh, that form the plan, uh, the, the form of the plan that it'll take. Uh, this includes making decisions on land use, transportation systems, population, intensity, the sequence of development, and the provision of essential services and facilities. Uh, so if you remember, because uh, I've talked to Council about this before, planning does occur within a legislated framework. So at the municipal level, it all starts with the municipal development plan. This sets out the high level planning goals and sets a vision and a strategy for how we will grow into the future. Next are the area structure plans and neighborhood structure plans, uh, which informs decision making for uh, redistrictings, uh, which enables us to approve subdivisions and development permits. <clears throat> uh, municipal development plan and area structure plans are considered to be statutory plans. Um, and the processes that follow are, the regu are regulated under the land use bylaw, uh, which allows us to approve subdivision and development permits. Uh, so area structure plans live here within the overall process. So currently the city has two residential based area structure plans, West Park and South Fort. Uh, these were both prepared by the city. Following the adoption of the municipal development plan, the developer is now typically responsible for preparing area structure plans, uh, but they must do so in accordance with the city's uh, terms of reference for area structure plans and neighborhood structure plans. The terms of reference for area structure plans provides framework for the preparation for a new area structure plan and it states that council must first give authorization before an ASP can be prepared. Creation of area structure plans are highly involved and technical and they must be established through a series of studies that determine and understand the site characteristics including land uses, uh, transportation, topography, geography, natural features, uh, property ownership, uh, among several other things as well. Then we look at, uh, through the process, uh, how those characteristics would influence and affect development, and then ultimately what the plan will look like and how it will develop out. So WSP Global, on behalf of Landrex, is requesting that Council authorize the preparation of a new area structure plan for 148 hectares of land in the area shown here. This area is west of Highway 21 
east of the North Saskatchewan River and south of the existing West Park neighborhood. Some notable features in this area include the Point of Pins Creek, Point of Pins Subdivision, uh, an end pit lake from a former gravel extraction operation, and then there's a, environmentally significant areas that are next to the river and also along the Point of Pins Creek. So why does Council need to authorize the preparation of an area structure plan within these lands? Again, the Municipal Development Plan uh, sets out the direction. It has policies related to sustainable, efficient and contiguous urban growth, uh, specifically within the uh, future urban lands. So in particular, there are three policies. Uh, this is policy 11.2.1 which is prioritizing fiscal sustainability through optimization of existing infrastructure assets by filling in or completing established and developing neighborhoods. Policy 11.2.2, development in, in existing serviced areas shall be prioritized, followed by areas where the extension of new services and infrastructure is logical, contiguous, efficient, and economical. And then last, Policy 11.2.4, existing neighborhoods will be largely built out as determined by the city prior to uh, new neighborhood plans being accepted. So in a nutshell, we need to be at a point uh, where new urban development is ready to go into the lands that were annexed in 2020. There's a number of factors that should be considered. Uh, this would include timing, location, land absorption, uh, local and regional competitiveness and social considerations including how a new neighborhood would be better positioned to achieve uh, planning uh, specific planning goals and objectives uh, than the existing. So in terms of timing if we were to take the position that we would not entertain any new area structure plans within the annex lands until the existing areas are developed out we would be at a point where we would be unable to accommodate any new development um, uh, at a, at a, uh, simply because it takes time to create an area structure plan. So um, if we were to wait till the existing areas were to develop out, um, it could be about, it's actually about a three to seven per, uh, year lag time, uh, which we wouldn't be able to see development. So, um, so timing is essential in this regard. Uh, and it has to be right. So drafters of an area structure plan have to consider what, what the conditions would be like, not today, but perhaps three to seven years into the future. Uh, the West Park neighborhood is about 93% complete, and it is anticipated that that neighborhood could be fully developed out within uh, four years. South Fort uh, neighborhood is about 64% developed out, and it could potentially be about 10 to 12 years before that area is developed. In terms of location, Highway 21 uh, is a physical landmark that does separate suburban growth within the city. Uh, the proposed area structure plan or the anticipated area structure plan would allow contiguous development off the built up areas that already exist uh, within West Park. Now, if the timing and location are right, a new area structure plan enables us to achieve specific planning goals and objectives that would be more difficult to achieve within the, the existing areas simply because there already uh, are existing uh, area structure plans and we do have to follow um, that planning, planning framework that exists. We also would have to go through a process of updating those area structure plans, but we would um, essentially be doing some tweaking through that process. So in other words, we're starting with a clean canvas. Uh, our MDP sets out specific planning goals and the terms of reference is the tool that would walk those goals into the new area structure plan. So what does your decision mean? Um, if if uh, authorized, it would kick off a process the proponent would establish who the stakeholders are that would be involved throughout that process, uh, what the existing conditions, site characteristics, policies, and regulations are that would affect development on the land. 
and how does the what and the who affect or uh, influence the plan itself. Um, it would establish where things like road, residential, commercial, schools, and parks would be located. Uh, and it would also set out uh, the timing and sequencing of development within that area structure plan. And then ultimately the plan would need to be approved by council and therefore it would need to be demonstrated why the final plan uh, is good for the city of Fort Saskatchewan um, and uh, in line with the policies and, and goals and objectives that we have. Uh, administration is recommending that council does authorize the initi initiation to prepare a new area structure plan um, for an area located south of West Park, or, uh, the West Park neighborhood and within the city's new uh, future urban area. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that council may have and uh, also as I mentioned before the uh, uh, the consultant is here as well to answer questions. Okay great thank you so we will go into uh, questions at this time Councillor Harris you're first and then I've got a couple. Mr. Mr. Thomas um, with respect to where we're sitting with developing our own overall view of what the annexed areas are going to look like. Administration has been working on the analytics on that from a servicing standpoint and whatnot. So my first question is when will Council have a more defined um, update as to where administration is sitting because ultimately that is, isn't that setting the stage for then the closer look that the uh, developer would then or the proposed developer would do relative to the overall development? So that's the first question. Uh, through you, Your Worship, Councillor Harris, um, yes, certainly the uh, servicing brief that is being worked on uh, does set the stage, so to speak. Um, the process of, of creating an area structure plan will tease some of those things out. Um, I can't really answer questions specific to the servicing brief. Um, Grant Schaefer is here if, if you have any specific questions. Well, I'm just asking when will council be given a more definitive update as to what, what that looks like? Yeah, because got... I respect that. So that's, I'm curious, when will that happen? I've got Mr. Fleming. Yes, Your Worship, it's currently scheduled for the, <clears throat> excuse me, April 18th uh, Committee of the Whole meeting. Okay. Second question, relative to this uh, area that's being proposed in the attached maps, it includes area that can be developed for residential and other uses and there's a whole bunch of kind of sterilized land I guess on the west side of uh, Point of Pins Estates, gravel extraction, large lake. So will this area structure plan then be looking at the uses of those kind of sterilized or undevelopable lands so they fit into the overall larger planning framework? Uh, through your worship, Councillor Harris, yes, that's uh, that's exactly right. We we do have very broad policy within the municipal development plan. So as we work through this process, we will be figuring out what uh, you know. We will be doing more refined planning within those areas. So for clarification, the developer is only going to be looking at that portion of that one quarter section, just directly west of Highway 21, and east of Point of Pins. That's all they're going to be looking at. So the area structure plan does include that area between the highway and the river. Um, okay. I would assume that the the urban development, the residential development and so forth would be limited to that quarter section. Right. So the developer is only going to have an interest on lands that they can develop. The rest of it will just have a stakeholder role in it in terms of what we want to have it look like in the future. Is that fair to say? Um, there will be some planning that will be done, so um, there will be some policies that will be set out. That will be part of the process. So okay. at city as a stakeholder would be involved in that. Yeah, and that'll be happening kind of in conjunction with all this with the developers, okay. people doing it. Okay, that's good. Okay, Councillor Blizzard, questions? Yeah, in Appendix A, it shows this area and the whole area in purple. But in Appendix B, it's got a red outline for NSP boundary. So what is, what is NSP? 
Um, you through your worship, Councillor Blizzard. So an area structure plan. Um, so we we we've shifted our our um, planning model, I guess, um, with the new municipal development plan and then the adoption of the terms of reference. So if you if you think of an outline plan, that is essentially what a neighborhood structure plan is. Mm -hmm. So a neighborhood structure plan would form part of the area structure plan. It would be an appendix to. Um, that way it's all considered to be a statutory document. So currently an outline plan, which we were discussing already today, is not a statutory document. Okay, so this NSP is neighborhood structure boundary. What happens to the area that's west of that? There's like a pie that's still gray in that appendix B right across from the point of pins. Is that going to be left undeveloped? Through your worship, I think at this time, I some of those details are are not known. Um, you know, if the uh, if the uh, consultant wants to answer that in more detail, I, I I defer to him. But my understanding at this point is we don't know exactly what that that neighborhood structure plan boundary would be. Oh, okay, that was just a rough lines drawn. It's not I, an accurate. I suspect so. So that that okay. kind of you know, similar to Councillor Harris's question okay. in terms of where that development would happen, um, it, I, I would suspect it would be teased out a little bit more. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm going next. So my question is kind of similar. So we've got one block of land that's being done as the ASP. So I guess my question, because I go back to when West Park uh, was being developed, the city did an area structure plan for the entire lands. So, and I understand we're changing our thought process to have the developer come in, but why are we not doing the ASP to cover that entire, the entire section? Like, uh, your worship, like you're all referring of it. to like four quarter sections, for example. Well, yeah, from, from where the road is, I don't know what this one's going to be called, but from this one to where the new boundary is on, on that side. I, it, it's a good question. Um, as part of the process, before we got here, we did have a scoping meeting, and it was identified that um, it would essentially be these lands. So in our area structure plan, uh, terms of reference, um, it does set out that the, the area of an area structure plan um, could be as small as one quarter section, and I, I believe it could be as big as four. So this being two quarter sections would fit within those requirements. Okay, but back to my question, why wouldn't we want to know how we want that entire area built out? You know, so I guess as an ASP for all of that, you know, to show where we want highway commercial, you know, uh, the, the different types of residential. It just seems odd to me we're only doing that one block. And again, it is it is a process that is driven by the developer, and then that's what they put forward. Okay, I'll let you go on that. <laughs> Sometimes the old days are better when you have the whole section done. So anyway, I'll shut up, uh, Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Uh is the developer going to present so that we can ask questions or are they available to answer questions at this juncture? They're available to answer questions at this time. We have one online and if Mr. Mc Chuck McNutt would like to join Mr. Schaefer, you're welcome to answer questions. Or I'm sorry, I'm looking at Grant. I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas, you can come up and if there's any questions to be answered, you can answer them if you direct them. So. Chuck McNutt is here, and uh, Mike Yocum is online. So do you have your questions for them? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm referring, I'm looking right now at the um, applicant ASP authorization letter, our Appendix A, which is the January 12th um, letter to the city from um, WSP. And, and I'm looking at, the letter isn't, I can't see page numbers on it, but it's page 63 of our materials. And it's at the start of that page where it says, 
the city growth study slash um, or hyphen November 2015. And I'm looking at the information that follows that so that everybody knows where I'm looking. Um, I read that piece of information three times. I am unable to decipher how much land is available in the city to put an, a future home on. Um, I do not understand the distinction between absorbed land and available land. And um, so help me understand, please, how much land currently is available within the city limits that we know them right now, taking out the newly, newly annexed lands, how much land is available and how many residential units would that accommodate, please? Mr. Thomas, I'll direct to you. Uh, Your Worship, I'll, I'll start and then um, Mr. McNutt can maybe back me up or help me out. But um, so currently what's left and I'll break it out into uh, what's, what's available in West Park versus what's available in the South Fort area structure plan area. So um, in West Park, the available land developable area that would be left would be um and this is this is gross land so not developable land but just it's it's real so um 21 hectares in west park um and then in south fort there's a, a, approximately 190 hectares left between 170 and 190 um so based on that what we're seeing uh, based on, on trends over the last six years is about 20 hectares per year within the city. So that would suggest that we have about 10 to 12 years left uh, within the existing area. So that's not including the annexation area. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thomas, because you've just responded essentially the way I interpreted it. Because when I go further into the letter to the table, um, the 20 hectares of absorption per year were applied to the net available hectares. And, and I truly thought it should be applied more logically to the available residential gross hectares. Um, is that a correct statement? Um, Your Worship, um, Councillor Kelly, yeah, I can, I can kind of respond a little bit to that, sure. And, and you're right, it, it uh, definitely is going to be applied to the gross area. And um, just for a clarification for maybe other people that are also listening in and maybe are a little bit confused on the, some of the terminology, um, the terms absorbed land and available land are used in the growth study. Yeah, put your mic. Okay. That's better? Yeah. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, so the term absorbed land and available land are used in the growth study, and it's pretty simple to, to think about it as lands that um, have both been rezoned and, and have a subdivision that's been registered are considered in the growth study as being absorbed. Whether or not there's houses built on them, whether or not there's families living in them and whatnot, as soon as it becomes zoned and the subdivision is registered, that the city considers that as being absorbed and more or less everything else then is available. And so that's kind of the differentiation in the growth study. And when it was done back in, in 2015, um, really that section that, uh, that Councillor Kelly was referring to uh, continues on to the next page and, and kind of ends with the table. And the table is a little bit clearer with respect to how, how it all goes. And, uh, and so, yeah, uh, in 2015, there was around 300 hectares worth of total land available, but now fast forward to 2022, and that's been reduced considerably uh, down to about 200 hectares. And so if you look at that 20 hectare, generally speaking, um, absorption rates, that's around 10 years overall worth of land that's left to go. Uh, and that's the um, available lands that, that need to that need to continue to get uh, get developed. So um, it was a little bit confusing as we were going through. I tried to sort it out a little bit, but that's basically that's the absorbed land is stuff that's already there, um, and the available land is stuff that has not yet either been rezoned or or subdivided. So it's uh, it's getting down to the end in West Park for sure. Uh, South Fort has a little bit of runway left, but not tons, and uh, it is it is time to move on. Hey, thank you. I appreciate your comments. I'm still not clear. It is possible for land to be 
rezoned and no residences or buildings to be built on it for years. So, so how many hectares of land are available, zoned or not, within the city, except prior city limits, excluding the annexation? How many hectares are available that do not have a house on it? Is that the 200 or the, three, the 193 number in your table? Or would that number, in fact, be greater? Uh, it's uh, it's going to be a little bit greater, um, Your Worship, because that number is South Fort and um, and West Park um, only. We've kind of looked at specifically on that, but there might be some smatterings of land uh, throughout the the community that that is not counted in that two hundred. It's a little bit, but not much. Maybe some infill pieces that I'm not aware of. Mr. Uh, Thomas, yeah, Your Worship, to uh, Councillor Kelly. So I think to answer your question. Because your, I think your question is available land with no no development that's that's physically on it. We're looking at about 210 hectares of land, and that's why, you know, when I when we're referring to about, you know, the trend, uh, averaging out to about 20 hectares a year development, um, that's why it works out to about 10 to 12 years worth of available land within uh, the developing area, which would exclude the annexation land. And I'm going to have more questions, but Mayor Catcher, if you'd allow me one quick one, and then I'll pause. In the last five or six years, Mr. Thomas, how many hectares have we actually developed, when I say developed, with a unit sitting on it per annum? Uh, through you, Your Worship, um, this would be a guess, but it would probably be fairly close. But um, probably in the last year, we've probably consumed... Um, around 90 to 100 hectares. In the last year, 90 hectares no, have been built upon? I, I apologize, the last five years. Actually built upon and or had a road surface put on them, but consumed in actual construction. Uh, correct, about, about 90 to 100 hectares, I would say. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, please I'll, come back to Yeah, I'll put you on a round two list. Okay. Uh, Councillor Noyan, you're still on round one. Whoops, sorry. Put the wrong person. Councillor Councillor Noyan and then Councillor Harris. Yeah, thank you. I want to refer to the letter WSP sent to Planning and Development and the, the sentence that uh, municipalities around the Fort Saskatchewan area, geographical area, can all be considered competitors for, for lot sales in Fort Saskatchewan. And my question would be to you, Mr. Thomas, um, what can you give us a kind of a, a sense of our mentality uh, for growth rates and pushing growth rate in Fort Saskatchewan um, as as, as opposed to, I guess, doing it as diligently as possible, do we really see ourselves as want to be competitors of neighboring municipalities to draw you know, more, more populous quicker here, or do we have different objectives? Uh, through you, Worship Councillor Noyan, I mean, our, our direction's always coming from the municipal development plan and the growth, the strategy that we have for growth um, really refers to, and, and I've talked about this before, but it's that triangle of you want to create good places. So we want to be, we want to plan our communities well. We want to do good planning. Uh, that's going to attract people. And you have a diversity of people in your community. That's also going to add other benefits as well, like economic diversification, economic development, that sort of thing. So that, that's really what we focus on. And I think if we focus on that, then that's going to achieve our objectives. We don't want to say, okay, well, what is Sherwood Park doing or what is Edmonton doing? But if we're not seeing any development at all, um, then that's, you know, we're not attracting people just, you know, so we want, we're, we're looking ahead. That's really the purpose of, of an area structure plan because it does take time to, to create one. And Your Worship, if I could add to that as well, the purpose of that comment um, in there, I, I wrote this, and so the purpose of that comment is that um, we have to understand that there are competing areas, and this is not to necessarily say um, competing head-to-head, uh, -head, day to day between the city of Fort Saskatchewan. It's if if there was no land available in Fort Saskatchewan for them to come here, they would choose some of these other areas. 
And so when land is available, then you have to consider that these you know, people that are, are, are ready, willing, and able to come and, and purchase a home, there's lots of other options for them. And so that was one of the arguments to, to, to look at this and say it's, it's time to, you don't want to get behind in having your planning done um, because, because the markets will be there when, when it's needed. All right. Okay. I, pr- I appreciate that answer. And, and thanks. Thanks for weighing in. My, my second question uh, is about the land use bylaw that's being rewritten right now and perhaps the vision that that gives developers to, um, to, to create an ASP. In my perspective, would it not be a little bit more prudent to, to wait until council adopts and if, if we choose to adopt the, the new L, LUB to, to perhaps give developers uh, you know, a, a vision for, for what could be in these, in these lands in the future? Uh, you worship through to Councillor Noy, and they are two separate, um, they're very separate documents, mm-hmm. I guess. And there wouldn't be any advantage, I think, of, of waiting. Um, we are still working through that process with the land use bylaw, trying to understand what the best approach to regulate land within um, the uh, future urban areas would be. Um, but they are independent processes. I, I understand that. I just thought there might be some benefit uh, to, to seeing it, and I, I, um, I gather you maybe get a sense of where I'm going. Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, but I, I think it's just a, almost a little bit backwards in some respects because um, what we, we do with the area structure plan is we create a policy and we create a vision for the community, and the land use bylaw generally, in some senses, actually implements that vision. And so sometimes we have to look at the area structure plan kind of create the community that we want to create and then and then respond in the land use bylaw with things that can can implement it so sometimes a, a land use bylaw although you're going through the process now um, even as you saw earlier today there's some product that may be out there that we don't necessarily know about and we'll start to uncover that as we're going through the planning process and the area structure plan and so we need to uh, include that in in some of the amendments that are going on so it's kind of a, an iterative process but but really the land use bylaw also has to has to follow in and, and make sure that we can implement the area structure plan policy that we're looking that we're trying to achieve okay thank you okay so we're on to round two councillor harris so mr thomas uh appendix c which was completed in 2015 isl did the uh, ultimately i guess development scenarios uh over time that was done for the annexation that was under discussion at the time was that correct giving us an idea of potential development uh, staging if it uh, had happened because we were looking at a much larger area for annexation than what we ended up with. Is that is that an understanding? Am I correct? I uh, through you worship to Councillor Harris. Uh, yeah, that's correct. That was that um, <coughs> study was done to um, support annexation and um, looking at how the city was developing. It kind of looked at the logical sequencing of what what could be developing. So um, it it's not necessarily a science but it was kind of based on what the trends could be so ultimately it was done just as a potential look forward and uh, it it includes a lot of area that was not annexed so ultimately it was just kind of a broader look at uh, at that development area are are the assumptions under which that planning was done or that analysis was done are any of them at all valid any longer because i look at it and i say hmm yeah, I, di- I didn't understand the logic on some of, some of that. Some of the timing on it makes sense, but I'm, does it, are those assumptions still valid, in your opinion, as a planner? Uh, through you, Worship, Councillor Harris, um, I think there is some validity in, in some of it. Um, it is, you know, and there is a, um, an asterisk there that kind of puts some caveats on it, but um, okay. at that time, it was based on, um, you know, landowner motivation what certain trends would be there would be a lot of a lot of caveats to how that would develop out but i think just in terms of um how the city has grown and and leading up to it and what could be logical sequencing of development i think there is still some rationale behind. so, so you touched on something really important and that's crucial to this whole discussion is what is landowner motivation and so at this point in time, Landrex has come forward. 
um, to do an ASP on this land that they're interested or they've acquired or they're looking to acquire. And other is like that one quarter section to the south doesn't have a landowner interest and hence it's not being looked at within this context. Is that fair to say? Uh, Your Worship, to Councillor Harris, I mean, I, I wouldn't be in a position to answer that right now. I well, just... doesn't that drive planning is where, where I'm coming from. You got a landowner that's looking at, or somebody that wants to be a landowner, is looking to define a level of planning to provide guidance so they can make a strategic investment in the acquisition and development of land. That's where this whole planning argument's coming from. Is that correct, Mr. McNutt? Is that where uh, you guys are at? Councilor Harris, I, I, think, I think that's uh, pretty accurate. I think uh, d developers uh, generally are in the communities. They go out and, and you know, their business is, is creating communities yeah. and growing neighborhoods, right? And so definitely the first step would be to go out and, and try to acquire land which with, within which they, they can do that. Um, they need to acquire a, a parcel of land that's large enough for them to, you know, justify the investment in the front end stuff, which is significant investment in the planning and engineering studies and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, they have to they have to I would say acquire a piece of property that makes the most sense um, to allow that process to move forward um, typically a quarter section would generally do it sometimes it's more sometimes not usually much less but definitely it would take um, some form of motivation in the terms of some some kind of size and context um, for the planning to make some sense and 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 that's I think where where most developers were you know yeah. are at right now and that, where we're coming from and that's why I'm asking the question I'm trying to tease out the you know the overall so that council I, myself and everyone sitting around this table understands kind of what's driving the need to undertake this the importance of it so it's just good planning in your opinion Oh, uh, um, Your Worship, Councillor Harris, I think it's a lot of things. Definitely good planning is coming into play. This is a contiguous development. Services are there. Access is there. Um, this makes the most logical sense to, to, to be the next piece of development. Um, you also have a developer in this case that uh, is one of the major developers in the city that is nearing completion in, in, in Windsor Point. Um, they're motivated. They want to stay developing in the city. They've been developing here for 40 years, so they want to keep going. So now you've got a developer that has the capacity to take on this task, and, and all these things are kind of coming together. I don't think it's any so that's, thing. that's a key. So thanks, thanks a lot. Appreciate your... Okay. Thank you. So we've got a full list still. Uh, Councillor Kelly, you are next in the speaking order on round two. Yes, thank you. Uh, you touched on it, Mr. Thomas. This is our first go at having an ASP put together by the developer. Why the change? I don't need a book, please. A Reader's Digest version. Why are the developers now doing this as opposed to the city? Um, through your worship to Council, Councillor Kelly, um, it is it is a practice that is pretty typical within the region, and I think in Alberta as well. It's also very um, for the city to do it. Um, we would be making a lot of assumptions for one. Um, with our current area structure plans, they are they are very very large, and in some ways they're they're too large. Um, to be as effective as they should be. And that model does not really align with some of the things that we want to achieve through our, um, through our municipal development plan. Um, it's also very costly to, um, for the city to undertake um, an area structure plan. And, and sometimes it's more effectively done and more efficiently done if it's done by the developer. Um, so what we did is we, we set out the terms of reference in which a developer would follow. We still have the ability to do, you know, there's nothing preventing the city um, from undertaking an area structure plan, but um, we feel that it's, uh, it's better practice and best practice if it's done by the developer. Thank you. Uh, this is probably for Mr. McNutt. We're looking at somewhere between three and seven years to complete an ASP on, on an area this size and a significant investment. Would it make sense then that once this investment is in and the plan is approved that the developers would be anxious to start selling off and developing that land as soon as possible? Um, 
Uh, your worship, Councilor Kelly, uh, absolutely. The you know time is is definitely uh, money, and uh, there's no doubt about it that uh, the purpose of this whole process is to get plans in place to do all the proper studies and to um, get development going. Absolutely, as soon as as soon as this can happen, they want to do it. But it is a long and, and very expensive process. Um, there's lots of studies that have to go on. There's a lot of things that have to be done. So, uh, so it does take some time. But definitely motivated to, to get it going as quickly as possible. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Councillor Blizzard. I'm prepared to make a motion. OK, I've got uh, two more for questions, I think. So I can come back to you once. Uh, once those questions have been answered. Uh, Councillor Noyan, you have one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it, just in the risk analysis uh, document given to us by, by planning and development, uh, it, it's saying that it could delay the build out of, of South Fort and I would assume the, the rest of West Park having an, an attractive new neighborhood potentially assuming that the build outs haven't happened by the time the ASP and then down to to neighborhood structure plans have been completed. Um, so, should should we be concerned that that we're we're going into new new lands and instead of encouraging the the marketability of what is currently being built? And and maybe you can elaborate on that a bit more as it's your your sentence there. I through your worship, Councillor Noy, and and again, I think it's it's really all about timing. So you know, we have to look at. If it's going to be about a three or a seven year process, where are we potentially at at this at that point in time? Um, if, if, for example, if West Park were to be fully developed out, then most of the development after that is going to be concentrated into um, into South Ford. Mm. Um, so it does, you know, it, it does allow for to contiguous development to happen immediately off of West Park. Um, so the rate of development that would be happening potentially in in, uh, in the South Fort neighborhood um, would be no different than what it is now. Um, just looking at how other municipalities, because there's been a number of municipalities in the, in the region that have gone through annexations and they've been looking at, okay, at what point are we going to go into those um, annex lands? And it's always a statement where um, you know, the, the existing neighborhoods are at a point where they're, um, they're, they're have, have a few more years of development left. Um, so currently, as we sit right now, we're at about 93% developed in West Park and about 64% in, in, in the South Fort neighborhood. So at that time, we, we will probably be well positioned to take on new development within the annexation area. Okay, I, I appreciate that response. No, um, thank you. Your Worship, I can sorry, oh. add a little bit more. <laughs> um, th there's also a notion of transition, too. Um, you can't, when you're moving from one stage to the next, or one neighbor to the next, or one area to the next, um, there's a transition period. And so what has to happen is, is you have to be able to um, keep your builders, um, be able to have enough product for them to be able to market into these new areas, still while backfilling the other piece. But you can't wait until one area is completely closed off and then come along and, and, and open the door for the next area. The builders, just, they, they don't have, they need to have enough product in, in front to be able to market it, to be able to sell it, to be able to start building into that area. And that, that transition time is, is hugely important so that you can keep your momentum, keep your builders, keep your, everything in place so you don't, again, end up having them having to leave because there's no product there and go into our draws or go into those other some of those other areas that we were talking about earlier right so so although you might want to think that you have to wait until one piece is finished you can't you have to have that transitional uh, ability as as you're moving as you're moving on into the new areas okay you're good that looks like all of the questions so i'm going to go to a motion so at this point in time thank you very much for coming thank up you. and answering the questions you can actually uh, go back to your seat because we will be getting into discussion and debate so um so there is a motion that is before us councillor blizzard i'd like to make it oh 
just push your button again. Sorry. Go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that Council authorize the initiation of a new area structure plan for an area approximately 150 hectares located south of the West Park neighborhood and within the city's future urban area. Thank you. I'll accept the motion. Do you wish to speak in favor? Yeah, I think uh, this is something that we need to get started or allow to get started so that uh, there will be land. Um, I know that builders, as they build, they will need new land to slowly move on to so that they have new offerings. And I think this is something that's going to take time. So good to get it started. Great. Thank you. Councillor Harris on discussion and debate. Um, I'll support the motion. Uh, this one, I think, is a watershed um, decision for Council because it really drives our approach to planning going forward, uh, particularly given the fact that we've got a large block of land that is not under any sort of planning framework other than it's in an urban reserve context. So we're also then looking to the developer to do the planning, which then council and administration will respond to as opposed to paternalistically lead. Um, and, and that's my background is obviously within a paternalistic planning context. So this is a new stretch for me, given the time that I've been in municipal government. But I'm interested in looking to see how it would go as long as our administration is really providing the appropriate input and guidance to the developer to ensure that they're broadly thinking, even though it's out, even it's focused on the area that they're particularly interested in making a strategic investment in, but to make sure that whatever they plan in that area is is appropriately guided by our planning philosophies and the fact that other land immediately adjacent to it. And the question I asked earlier, the undevelopable land even though that they're not buying that, needs to be looked at within an overall planning framework. And if, if that comes back to council, then I think that's probably going to be an interesting case study in, in urban planning and development for us as elected officials. And so uh, I'll support it on that basis, but I want an assurance from administration that, that you are coming back to us from time to time so that we can see how this process is unfolding and that we are continuously plugged in as opposed to just getting it dropped on us in 18 months and say, oh, by the way. And so we'd be sitting here then wondering, oh, okay, so what does that all mean? How do these moving parts all mesh together so that we end up with a smooth, planned machine for the growth of our community going forward. That's crucial in my mind. And I think it would be a very interesting experience for all of us as elected officials to get in. So I'll support it on that basis because it's an interesting uh, switch on things. So I'll support it. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Kelly on discussion and debate. Thank you. I have concerns. I support the concept, I truly do, and I get the need for advanced planning. I, I absolutely get that and understand that it's a long-term approach, a long-term project. The, the, the issue that I have is a completion of the infrastructure in the existing areas of Fort Saskatchewan. Um, West Park Boulevard has been built out in pieces for at least 25 years now. And I don't know if it's completed yet. It's, it's getting close, admittedly, but it, it's a long-term process. When you get to South Fork, we have issues with Greenfield Way. Um, Council's well aware of those. Um, Allard Way and the lack of an extra egress, ex, ac, exit or entry to that whole area of Fort Saskatchewan off of Highway 21. If I had assurances that that infrastructure would be built out so that those areas of Fort Saskatchewan are properly serviced, I would have no problem with starting construction on the other side of Highway 21. The issue is if, if the other side of Highway 21 is in fact deemed or perceived as more desirable for whatever reason, the, the remaining street build out arterial and collector build out in, in, in South Fort could be delayed many, many years. Administration offered a, a, an off the shoulder estimate that 
it would be 10 to 15 years. And that was last fall or a year ago when we were dealing with those issues. Um, if in fact development starts on the other side of the highway, it's not hard to imagine that that 10 to 15 years could grow to 20 to 25 years before it's built out, if, 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 if even then. So what I'm looking for from administration and or the development community is what sort of assurances can you give council and more importantly, the residents of those areas of Fort Saskatchewan, that these areas will be completely built out with the infrastructure necessary to allow for a seamless way of life um, before construction starts or development actually starts on the other side of Highway 21. What commitment are you prepared as developers to put in? And if they'd like to offer a comment, I'd be prepared to pause and listen, Mayor Catcher. We're into discussion and debate right now, so I would probably say no to that. Well, we do answer, have questions all of administration all the time in discussion. Well, administration can answer, but I'm not bringing the consultant up. So, and let me address the question to Mr. Thomas or Mr. Fleming. What assurances can you give council and, more importantly, the residents that this development will be finished off at least the infrastructure before we start building someplace else? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Kelly, um, I, it would be, I think, hard to give assurances right now, and, and we can only go with what we know at this point in time. So um, in, in response to your previous question in terms of what the trends have been, and, and we've seen uh, absorption at about 20 hectares per year. So looking forward, um, it, you know, it, we're, it, it, it's hard to give an absolute guarantee or an assurance that the areas would be developed out, but at the same time, it would be a reasonable um, point in time to accept uh, a planning framework that would accommodate future development within the annexation lands. So there is a bit of a risk, but it is, it is a risk that's based on, on development trends um, over the past five years or six years. Okay, okay. Mr. Thomas, we have at 20, at 20 hectares per year, we have approximately 10 years. Um, if in fact this area structure plan is done in five years and the development community comes to the city at that time and says, we've got this investment, we want to start building on it, we're five years from absorbing the rest of the land in South Fork. At what point in time does South Fork get the remaining infrastructure? You turned your mic off. <laughs> Through you, Worship Councillor Kelly, it again, it would be it would be hard for for me to answer that. And and again, I think we're just looking at at looking forward and um, um, how to uh, how to look at planning in the future. Do you, Worship? If I could add to Mr. Thomas's comments, um, it's important to note that the motion today is to initiate the planning process. It can take up, up to three years, if not beyond. Before shovels can go in the ground or development can proceed, the ASP will be brought back to Council for consideration and adoption. At that point, there will be a much more realistic um, understanding of what South Fort will look like at that point. Thank you. And at that point, will it be possible for council to say, thank you for the ASP, but we're not going to allow any development over there until you build out the infrastructure or complete the infrastructure in, in the remaining area of South Fort? Will that be possible for council to say that? Uh, through you, Councillor Kelly, um, if, if we're at a point in time where the area structure plan is... Uh, a draft is ready to go before council. Um, ultimately, it will be the will of council whether or not it would be uh, approved or not. It could be something that they it, it could be put off for a period of time. Um, I think that would, again, be completely at council's discretion at that period of time. Well, I, I appreciate your, your, your answers, both of you. And, and they're not, not easy. I fully understand that. But the concern is that the way we develop in this community is that the last block of street goes in essentially when the last lot is actually sold for development. 
which could mean that the remaining important arterials and collectors in South Fork don't get built for a very, very long time. And I'm not getting any assurances from administration in your responses that there's a way to deal with that. I don't have a way either. But it causes me to think that perhaps we should pay attention to the municipal development policies that you've elucidated in, in the in or that WSP elucidated in their in their letter to, to administration. And each and every one of those policies would lead me to believe that we're a bit early in this process. But in fact, given the absorption rate, we can delay the, the start of this and the investment, by the way, of the development community in an ASP for another couple of years to give assurances that in fact, the existing areas of Fort Saskatchewan and the existing residents of Fort Saskatchewan will have the infrastructure in place in a timely basis. And I'm not hearing that, and that is my concern. I'm concerned about the existing residents, not about the future residents that are 10 years away from moving here, the existing residents. And, and it's only fair to suggest to council and to administration and to the development community that the needs and the concerns of the existing pool of residents need to be given some serious consideration. So I get it, I understand the desire I cannot support it at this particular juncture, again, because of the concerns I've tried to elucidate in the last five minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So myself, um, I will support this. The motion is that we authorize the initiation of the new area structure plan. And I think it's very important to understand, once again, how long it takes to get these documents in place and that we have a good selection of developers and builders that come to our community. You know, um, I'm, I'm not a fan of stifling and only having one developer here because then you really limit yourself. Um, you know, as I drive down by, um, oh, that first intersection uh, going into West Park, we've got uh, th two or three apartments and then it comes to a kind of a triangle piece. Well, it would be finally nice to be able to see how that's going to build out into the future. You know, this, this is future planning. It's not about planning for tomorrow. It's planning for a few years down the road. And I think administration has made a compelling argument that this is the timing and this is the recommendation that's being put forward and I fully support it. Councillor Harris. Um, I can appreciate Councillor Kelly's concern. Um, and I think we've had a conversation about the issue in South Fort as it relates to the build out of the access and egress points. Uh, to alleviate some of the transportation challenges and bottlenecks. Um, I, th I think we have the opportunity as a council, and administration can correct me if I'm wrong, if we feel as a council that we need to see certain types of infrastructure uh, undertaken at any given time, we have the ability to front end it. That means a series of negotiations with landowners ultimately to acquire land against which to build a major uh, access point or arterial. But we have that ability, do we not, Ms. Duguid-Smith? To your worship, that is correct. And it is important to note West Park Drive was uh, developer funded. It was their project where uh, this road is levy funded. Yeah, so, so ultimately we have the ability to do planning if we wanted to and ultimately recover that through offsite levies over time because it inures to the benefit of the lands that are being planned out. Um, I, I, I think this is nothing more than an opportunity to start the planning process. I support it on that basis. And, uh, but I think uh, we have to be mindful of some of the comments uh, that have been made around the table today and uh, that uh, Councillor Kelly has uh, made out. That, that talks about a broader discussion in terms of the overall opportunity to look at a development community that is competitive and is prepared to bring to market appropriate products um, and uh, assets that ultimately people want to buy and, and live on. And uh, that means uh, they have to make strategic investments in the infrastructure to do so. But if we felt it was so crucial, I want council to understand from my point of view, if it's that important to us, we can front end those costs and recover them over time. 
and that ultimately helps us drive development in various parts of our community if we're so concerned about it. And if that's a fair statement, Mr. Thomas, say yes. If it's not a fair statement, say no, and I'll shut up. I'm not sure if that was a question or not, but well, <laughs> yes. Thank you. It was a question. Thank you. Okay, I've got Councillor Kelly, and then I'll go to Councillor Blizzard for close. Um, thank you, Councillor Harris. I appreciate your comments. Please explain to to myself at least the distinction, a brief distinction description of the difference between developer funded and levy funded. I think I understand, but please make sure that I want my belief to be clarified. Ms. Smith, for sure. So, uh, developer fund or the developer led project was initiated by the developer. They fronted it, ended the cost, and built the road with their contractors to our specs. Uh, the 94th Street extension, which would be uh, comparable to this situation, was a levy project, which means our engineering department uh, led the project, determined when the need was warranted, and used the levy funds to pay for the project. And are all of the existing remaining arterials and collectors in the South Fort area to be funded by levy? Thank you, Your I'm not 100% sure about the collectors, but this road, this arterial, is to be funded through the levy. Well, it would be nice to have certainty. Um, if we're going to reference a particular model, I'd like to know if the model actually applies. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Councilor Harris, you're right. I've always understood that the city can, in fact, front end completion of some sort of infrastructure on, on a levy basis. So I have a question of administration. In the history of Fort Saskatchewan, how many times has that happened? Yes, Your Worship, I, I know it has happened. Um, Mr. Schaefer thinks three or four times. I think West Park, uh, there was a significant amount of front ending in West Park back in the day. And I know that because we were still getting paid back some of that money until until very recently, or perhaps we're still getting still getting paid back some of that money. Um, so it has happened before. And it it's actually a, a fairly common practice. There's some other municipalities. I know it happens often. So... And the West Park was for what, Troy, please? Yeah, please. Um, Your Worship, the Councillor Kelly, the, the biggest piece, I think, for West Park would have been the reservoir when it was first built. But not for roadways. Has there ever been an example of it being front-ended for, for collectors or arterials to get them completed uh, for the existing citizens? The Worship of Council Kelly, yes. Um, there was areas in West Park, I believe part of 95A Avenue, part of West Park Boulevard, were part of that front-ending agreements early on in the development of West Park. Okay, so there's some precedent for it. That helps me. Um, thank you both for your responses. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Councillor Blizzard to close. I'm gonna push your button. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's a good idea to get this started because it does take a few years and I look forward to getting maybe, I don't know if we get interim reports, but maybe updates on how it's going and look forward to seeing how it goes in the end, what it looks like. Okay, thank you. So the motion is now closed. Please cast your vote. And that is carried five to two. All right, thank you very much. So we will move on to our last item, which is debenture bylaw C2-23. Shannon and Druco. Welcome, Shannon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Shannon Andruco, Manager of Budget and Financial Planning. I'm here today to present for information regarding the borrowing bylaw C2-23 
for the purpose of the Veterans Way Corridor widening Phase 1 construction. As a result of Council's approval of the 23 um, capital budget and the requirements of the Municipal Government Act, a borrowing bylaw must be passed before construction can commence on Veterans Way Corridor. Once Council gives bylaw C2-23 first reading, an advertisement will be placed uh, and published in a local newspaper for two consecutive weeks. Once the advertising has occurred, the bylaw will be presented for second and third reading. The borrowing bylaw is in the amount to not exceed $4,970,000 as per the approved 2023 capital budget. The estimated cost of the debt servicing at today's interest rate is approximately $390,325 over a 20-year term. The actual borrowing term and interest rates will be deter determined upon application to financial institutions and will be done in accordance with the debt policy, debt management policy. Therefore, the recommendation is that Council gives first reading to bylaw C2-23 to incur debt for the purpose of the Veterans Way Corridor widening phase one project in the amount not exceeding $4,970,000. That concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you. So I'll open it up to questions. Councillor Harris. So in the bylaw, um, it says that um, in the second paragraph, the city, last line, the city of Fort Saskatchewan estimates that grants and contributions will not be applied to the project. So that would suggest to me that if we were, and we have applied for grants, I understand, or we're in the process of trying to apply for grants, is that correct? So as of today, we don't have any any grants. So um, if we do get grants, we will apply it to the project. So does the bylaw then have to be amended uh, to remove that statement, or is that just a, a you know an omnibus statement? We don't have any grants applied for right now, but if we do, um, can I defer that to Mr. Fleming? Um. To your worship, I don't believe we would have to amend the bylaw, but that's something we can look into before it comes back for final reading. So the essence of my question, though, is we are applying for grants, respecting that when we first conceived of the project, we didn't think there would be any. Is that a fair fair assessment? Uh, to your worship, we're not aware of any grants that would apply to this specific project that are out there, but we have been looking and we have made a formal request for provincial support, not through a grant program necessarily, but... Uh, so we have made a formal request to the province. So notwithstanding giving this bylaw eventually third reading, the window of opportunity to be applying is still there, and we're still pursuing that opportunity to offset the costs to the residents of Fort Saskatchewan. With your worship, that's correct. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kelly, questions? Yes, thank you. Just a quick question. For second and third reading, will we know what the actual interest rate on the on the borrowing will be? In other words, will the terms be firmed up for second and third reading? No, we have to wait for second and third reading to um, actually start doing the formal process of um, getting the, the the borrowing done. Is there a point where administration, and it, I don't know what interest rates are doing on a municipal level. Um, I actually thought they were higher based on comments I'd heard than what you guys quote in your in your proposal. Is there a, a some sort of rate where administration would say we're going to wait and not move ahead? Um, in the bylaw and the report, we have not to exceed 10%. Eesh, okay. Um, but just for confirmation, then administration would consider moving ahead if the interest rate was 8.9%? Uh, that would be correct. Is it possible to give third reading, send administration to the marketplace, and bring that back for a final review before we actually sign on the dotted line? 
Um, I'd have to get back to you on that. I am unsure of that. From my understanding, we have to wait for third reading to actually start the process, the, the official process. Mr. Dance, do you have any confirmation on that? Through your worship, I don't, but um, we can certainly provide more details when we do come back for, for second and or third reading in terms of, of timing. So I think uh, Ms. Andruco has provided the current rate. I believe the budget rate that we had applied when we did the budget was slightly higher. So we have seen rates come down slightly, but we will certainly endeavor to, to get the most favorable rates, looking at both the provincial options as well as, as financial institutions. And I am not su suggesting in any way that you won't. I just wonder if, if we can have more detail for second and third reading, that would be great. And I'll leave it at that for now. I think my point is made. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Noyan. Questions? Yeah, thanks. That answered part of my question uh, on interest rates. So when is this coming back for second and third reading? I would, I would assume really soon. Yeah, we have to do an advertisement for two weeks. Okay. okay. So it'll be likely in March. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. So that goes to Mike. Oh, okay. Well, I'll ask my question. So I know you said you had to advertise for two weeks, but I thought under a borrowing bylaw, before it could come back, you had to give public sufficient time in case they wish to petition it. Ms. Moulter? Uh, Your Worship and members of council, what I can tell you, uh, the MGA does give prov provisions uh, for petitions with timelines, uh, depending on the nature of the particular bylaw that's being petitioned against. Um, it ranges from um, 15 days to 60 days after the second um, point of advertising that um, uh, a petition could be received within. So. Technically, a bylaw could receive third reading and still be petitioned against. So how does that work then, if, uh, if it were to be given? So you advertise for two weeks, uh, it gets approved, and then it gets petitioned within that 15, 60 days. And, and if there was sufficient um, signatures, what happens then? Uh, Your Worship, given that we haven't gone through that. We would have to look at that more in detail to see okay. how. I'm just asking the hypothetical because I'm just making sure our time frames are correct when we're when we're saying we're passing these things. Uh, Councillor Abatoye. Thank you for your presentation. Just a simple question: what What does this new borrowing take us in terms of our debt limits? Um, it'll. Bring us to about 20 percent okay so not much change okay. very good thank you okay thank you so that appears to be all of the questions all right so what is the wish of council councillor harris um i'd be prepared to move the council get first reading to bylaw c2-23 to incur debt for the purposes of phase one of the veterans way corridor widening project in an amount not exceeding $4.97 million. Thank you. Would you like to speak in favor of your motion? Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's one, of those, uh, one of those numbers of municipal infrastructure that you have to undertake. Um, we have to plan for the future. And uh, I think administration has brought forward appropriate arguments to support this particular project. I know various members of council uh, don't necessarily think it's required. And I, at one time, didn't, but I'm of the opinion now that it probably makes sense to get it done. And so that's why I'm support, uh, supporting uh, passage, first, first reading of the bylaw. Okay, thank you. The motion is now open for discussion and debate. So I'm just going to go on record as saying I'm not going to support the motion. As indicated before, I'm probably the only person who doesn't see the need for this widening, and I'm not going to make this motion about the widening or the road. So it's just about taking on the debt for it. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, when the provincial government or provincial budget comes out that there will be some funding that will go alongside of this because it is a number one project that is contained within the intermunicipal uh, transportation plan and I would be very disappointed in the provincial government if there wasn't some funding based on this but um, 
I stick to my guns when it comes to uh, supporting or not supporting this. So I'm just going to go on record as I'm not supporting it. Uh, yes, Councillor Noyan. Yeah, just a quick comment. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing, given that we have a, a ceiling of, of interest rates, uh, according to our policy, I'm looking forward to seeing this on, on second and, and third rate, uh, reading. Uh, it, yeah, obviously things are changing with interest rates and, and that could affect uh, this project and how it affects the uh, yeah, future, future of Fort Saskatchewan residents. Okay, thank you. Uh, there doesn't appear to be any more discussion and debate. Councillor Harris on close. All right, the motion is now closed. Please cast your vote. And the motion is carried five to two. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Andruco. All right, the next item that we have, uh, are there any notice of motions? Not hearing or seeing any. Uh, are there any points of interest? Okay, not hearing or seeing any. Any counselor inquiries to administration? Okay, uh, so with that, I will take a motion to go into closed session. Would one of you two like to make that? Okay, Councillor Noyan. I, I move that council enter closed session for matters under FOIP. Thank you. The motion is closed. Please cast your vote. And the motion is carried unanimously. We will retire for in camera. Thank you.